John, too good. Welcome to my podcast. Lovely to be here, Dom. Lovely I'm here. I'm so wrapped that um, when I reached out to you with a DM, you, you said yes because I I looked on Spotify and Apple, and I, I don't think you've done a long form chat before. No, no. I, I I've sort of the only sort of things I've got with podcasts is I, I do five k walks every day. That's my that's my jam, right? So so was, rock and roll these yeah, days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I listen to either the rest is history, the rest is politics, um, catch up on what's happening around the world, uh, catch up on things that happened before I was alive, and uh, trying to understand the world better while doing something healthy for myself. That's my podcast thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I love that. Now people are going to get to um, hear you in a, a long form conversation, and it's a, it's a, it's an absolute honour for me to have you here. Oh, um, yeah, quick bio, John Toogood from She Hard. More number one albums than anyone else. Mm-hmm. Uh, male vocalist of the year, 1996, 1998, 2000. It's which like is, you only entered every second year. Yeah, which is funny <laughs> because I, I mean, it's, I, I reckon after 33 years, it's only in the last sort of five that I've learned how to sing in tune. So it's funny that I've got those awards before I learned that bit. What, what do you mean? Is that just self-deprecating? Or? No, no, no. That's actually true. Like I, I didn't learn really how to because the You're thing sh- is sort of shouting stuff. Well, you mean. no. Well, the thing is with with rock music, it's so loud. You tend to like sing sharp naturally because it's just you're just trying to get get there. And I'm singing quite high stuff as well because I'm a massive U2 fan, and that's where Bono sung and blah blah blah. And um, and so you tend to overshoot it, and volume doesn't help with pitching. And it wasn't actually until I did things like the Brell sort of theatre show where I'm singing with people like Tama Waipara mm. and Julia Deans and um, Jennifer Ward Leland, and they're all singing in tune, and I'm going. Oh, right, <laughs> there's where the note is, you know. So it's only in the last, I'd say maybe in the last 10 years that I've really learned how to go, oh, that's where I should be singing. Well, it's been a hell of a career for someone that didn't know how to sing until middle age. Yeah, not bad, not bad. Uh, yeah. Also, New Zealand Music Hall of Fame 2010, first Hall of Famer I've had on the podcast. Oh, it's wow. an absolute honour. Um, and opened for legends like ACDC, mm-hmm. Metallica, mm-hmm. Guns N' Roses, Black Sabbath. Yep. Um, and just so much um, adversity from a band perspective and a personal perspective sure. as well. Sure. I'm, I'm looking forward to digging into as much or as little as that as you want to. Okay. Um, first of all, I, I was trying to reflect on um, my first experiences with She Had. It may have been the Rhinic Mountain Rock Festival. I don't know. I'm from oh, yeah. Palmerston North. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the very first memorable one was a show you guys were doing at... Um, I think it was called the Rainbow Stadium or the Pascal Street Stadium in Palmerston North. Oh, yeah. And it was a big one. I think it was Head Like a Hole. I, I might get some of this detail wrong, but I think it was Head Like a Hole, You Guys, Weta, yep. and Feelers. And Feelers, oh, cool. I think, were Headline Act. That's and, right. And you guys were on earlier. And fucking hell, mm. you just blew it blew it away. It was like, I felt bad for the Feelers when they came on stage. I did. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> But it was just, it was like nothing else I'd ever seen. It was just, it was tired, it was energetic. This is, um, this is probably still when, when Dave Grohl was a drummer in Nirvana. Sure. And um, later on when I saw the Foo Fighters, I was like, Dave Grohl's like John Toogood on stage. Yeah, um, it's funny because he, he, he saw us on a big day out early. And then while we were living in Melbourne, he went on Channel V, which is a music channel, and went, she had the best live band on the planet. And I was like, what? That's the guy, that's the drummer from Nirvana. It was like... Wicked, you know, Mm. so he was into it, you know, like he was into our band. He would watch side of stage and stuff. So, um, yeah, that was pretty cool. And we've sort of, every time I bump into him, which is sort of irregularly, I I met him on when he did them Crooked Vultures, but he always comes up and go, hey, John, how you going? And blah, blah, blah. Mm. And he's he's a really decent human being, you know, like... Which is cool. Well, it, it, lots of parallels between you guys, like the the on stage um, charisma and presence, and just your uh, just the heart you have for the, for the fans and the audience. Mm, mm. Um, you leave nothing out there, and also um, you're a decent human off off a stage as well. I think um, like our paths only cross sort of really because I was always in mm. sort of pop music radio. Yeah. And the first time I interviewed you and the band, I I kind of I don't know what I expected. I kind of expected you to be like dismissive or yeah, you know, aloof or rude or whatever. Um, but you couldn't be nicer guys. Yeah. We, 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 because I think the, the, the good thing about She Had is we all met at high school. Uh, we all watched our, watched each other grow. And when anyone got, their ego got too big, it was like slapped down like, <laughs> like a group of brothers, you know? So, so it was never, and because we're from New Zealand, we've got that sort of, well, you know, it's a self, it is a self deprecating sort of sense mm. of humor. And the idea is to, we where, where you do the magic is that hour on stage, right? And that's where you get to be that rock star or that's where you get to like slay, right? But we always worked out that 
it's about work ethic and it's about it's all about you know communities i mean like in, in your industry it's mm. always it's who you know you know yeah. and it's like so you don't want to be acting like a brat uh, and and you know pissing people off left to right and center that doesn't serve you it serves you to do your job to the best of your ability and then just be a decent human being mm. we're also brought up with pretty good um family lives we we're very fortunate in that way um and uh you know, my parents were both working class Londoners that came over in the 50s and had their kids over here. They came from sort of, yeah, lower, lower, lower class, middle, lower middle class, I suppose. Dad was a chippy. Mum was worked at state insurance. And it was like that whole, I used to watch people behave badly around when we first started out. And I'd just be like, it just looks so bad, mm. you know, and, and it doesn't, it doesn't help anybody. It's like, you're actually just um, using your power badly, you know. The power comes from what you do. It's it's about the craft. It's about the art, you know. So, we we were lucky enough to play with ACDC really early on in 1991, and watch these older guys work hard for three and a half hours on stage. And it was all about the show. It wasn't about being wicked and and a rock star. It was about being the mm. real shit, you know. So we were lucky enough to play with a few great bands and see a few great bands when we started i think that set us off on the right path we toured with midnight oil they had in australia they similar vibe it's all about the show it's not about being a rock star and um and they had something to say you know so i think we were just lucky that the universe guided us to see things that were good examples rather than bad examples right yeah. right yeah, so let's go back to the early days. So young John, I've heard in an interview you talk about being um, your parents being 10 pound poms. What does, what does that mean? So that means they were basically, they right. took, saw an advert while they were living in London, start a new life on the other side of the planet. Have you got a trade? Have you got any skills? We need some, you know, we need more workers down in New Zealand. And they both took, independently took a punt on coming out to this place on the other side of the planet and start a new life. Uh, my mum was married young to somebody else. Uh, she, it was a, he was cheating on her, so she basically told him one day in Wellington that she was going down the shops, jumped back on the boat and, and sailed back to England. Independently, my dad made his way back to London from New Zealand and then met in London and fell in love, got married, and then decided to come back to New Zealand together and start a family. <laughs> so that was it, yeah, yeah. Amazing. And um, it seems like they were really good role models. Like your, your mum... Um yeah, incredible backstory, eh? So, so um, Jewish. Yep. Growing up in the UK in World War Two, didn't she have to change her name? Yeah, so it was less Jewish. Ch changed from Burstein to Burston. Right. Uh, they were all worried about Hitler sort of making it across the ditch, you know. So they um, they changed their second name. Mm. Um, so she was she was Ashkenazi Jew. So it, you know the, the Jews that the the, the Jews find the, they're, they're lower class Jews. You know the travelling travelling gypsies. You know. <laughs> um, I think Amy Amy Winehouse came from that sort of right, sort okay. of vibe. You know, and then my dad was just uh, just I mean I've done my genealogy and it's yeah he's just london working class one of nine kids you know mm -hmm. like uh yeah and they both they both had pretty bad experiences with the war they were both billeted out you know into the countryside mum was okay but dad was in a really abusive place where mm -hmm. he was made to work and blah 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 and um yeah so they had pretty tough upbringings uh dad got a trade w as a carpenter um but yeah they just they just started, took a punt. I mean, I, I can't believe you'd do that, you know, like, you know, uproot your whole life and go to another place that you'd never even seen. But they did it, you know, and um, and I'm so glad that they did because it was a beautiful country to grow up in, you know, yeah, as a kid. Yeah, it you know. served you well. So what was what was young John like? You, you were really good at cricket, right? Yeah, I mean, that was... Like in the Wellington... Sport. Yeah, I was captain of the Wellington Primary School's cricket team. So I used to play against Chris Kens, who was captain of the Canterbury cricket team in my team i had mark ellis i also had danny Hymona, who became dan damn native the rapper wow. um so he was my opening bowler he was formidable um but um uh yeah and and it was it was great you know and then i met tom at high school and he gave me a copy of ace dc's highway to hell and metallica's ride the lightning and said i heard you played guitar because i had learned to play classical guitar between seven and eleven and uh and sort of put it aside when I played cricket. And then uh, he said, 
you, you got to learn how to play an electric guitar. And I was like, I don't know what an electric guitar is, even looks like. But yeah, sure. And he showed me how to go, j -j -j, and then I was like, I'm away. <laughs> I started writing straight away. You yeah. Know, like, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, when you, so you got your first guitar at seven? At, at seven. So basically, the parents, my parents took us back to London to meet all our family because we were brought up by basically all the people we called uncle and auntie were just the people that came over on the boats. So all the um, expats. So I finally met my family at around seven and um, in London and I saw my uncle Charlie play uh, acoustic guitar. And before that, prior to seeing him play, I was under the impression that that musicians were almost not human. They were superhuman. You know, it wasn't normal people that made music because both my parents loved music, but they didn't play. Who and who who were they into? Like, what, what was the music in so the house? Dad was uh, Ella Fitzgerald and uh, um, Frank Sinatra. Right, oh, the classics. Yeah, that sort of stuff. But they did have uh, Beatles' Hard Days Night, and that mm. was the album that I just played over and over again. Yeah, are you, are you a massive like Beatles head? Massive. Oh Beatles my God, head. same, yeah, I'm yeah, obsessed yeah, yeah. with the Beatles. Absolutely obsessed, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> For me, the, the, the Peter Jackson three-part series on Disney was not long enough. I watched it three times, yeah, and I could <laughs> so watch it. So good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the, the interplay between Lennon and McCartney because there was a, the, the, sort, the whole chat that they hated each other and mm. they didn't. They didn't. They no. were very playful with each no, other. No, totally, and they were so young when yeah. even then, you know, after all that experience and where they were in their career, they were still in their 20s when mm. they you know, so it's pretty. I just love the fact that it looks like they look like contemporary human beings, and you can actually imagine what it's like to be there. You know, it's yeah, yeah. such an amazing thing. And, and you, I, you, you, with your musical knowledge, you'd have like a greater appreciation of this than any of us uh, ever could. But the output of work they did in oh, such a short huge. career. Yeah, it's huge. <laughs> it's huge. And I, it's really good watching their process. Like, Let It Be is not one of my favorite records. It's probably my least favorite Beatles record. But watching them go. Okay, this is just a placeholder line, but it's fine for now. We've just got to get this process happening, and uh, that that is really inspiring as a writer because the one of the biggest blocks to writing is going, this is not good enough. So you stop. You know, it's like they they just went they just pushed through because they'd been writing and mm. writing and writing. It's like it doesn't matter if that line's good. That line's good. We just need to find that later. So let's just keep going. You yeah, know? yeah. I really liked that. I, I, I want to get to that your your personal songwriting process um, because I, I so some of your songs are, are just um, just out, out, like Pacifier, for example. Uh, mm. I always enjoyed that as like a rock sort of pop rock anthem, I guess. Mm. But then when I got a greater understanding and appreciation of um, what the song was about. It just gives me goosebumps to this day every time I hear it. It's just yeah. a fabulous song. Mental yeah. health song before anyone was even talking about mental health stuff. Yeah, well, because because I had was having first-hand experience with a friend of mine who was bipolar and one of the most talented musicians I've ever seen, but was constantly kneecapping the, their own career. But it wasn't... And I was wondering why they were doing that, but then when I learnt more about his mental mm -hmm. health issues, it made sense. And I think it was... That, that song was just, for me, it was just like... I, I've seen you come out of this and I've seen you go into it. And I, and I know that if you can come out of it once, you can come out of it again. Mm. It was just more of that. It's interesting. A lot of my songs that I write about other people, I'm still thinking about myself as well. It's like, because I go... in a way. Yeah, because I go through dark patches as well. I mean, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an artist. So it's like all musicians are sensitive beings. We were just talking about that before. But we're attracted to this because... It's a way of micro-focusing and also understanding ourselves and our world better, right? So you get to write poetry and go, oh, that's what I'm thinking. Oh, that's why I feel uncomfortable. Mm. Oh, that's why that annoys me about the world. And it's like, but because we're sensitive, it means that as much as we can be, you know, like, that, that, that's a problem with, with being sensitive. It's like there's n no middle ground. You're either a god or an ant, you know, and that's <laughs> and that's what that's the life you have to swing yeah, yeah, with, yeah. you know. And so, and some people are more extreme, and other people are less extreme. I think I'm quite manageable because I sort of worked out myself and what my triggers are, so I I can see myself going down a dark place. I just got to look after myself, you know, like more sleep, less caffeine, <laughs> yeah. and, and being around people that that are nourishing and encouraging rather than you know, destructive. Mm, yeah, yeah, people that charge your social battery rather Absolutely. than drain it. So, so were, you, were you an angry kid? Um, I think I think because I come from real working class sort of stock, I always had a real issue with injustice or people in powerful positions 
exploiting people in less powerful positions. That has always been with me, and I think that just comes from my parents. Um, it was always like you help the people who have got less than you, and and when you watch people that have got more than other people being greedy or or exploitative uh, over people that have less, you call them out, you know, and that's and. And I still have that, yeah. So it's interesting when I go on Hoss King, he goes, "You're still angry, John." It's like, <laughs> well, well, I think there's plenty to be angry about. I think there's still massive inequality in the world. I think there's massive injustice in the world. So yeah, I'm still angry at certain things, but I'm also still, I'm a. The reason I'm angry is because I love humans mm. and I love uh, what they're capable of, you know. And I and and I um. And that's the only reason I'm angry. Mm. You know, I'm not angry because I hate the world. I feel, feel like anger ang is even the wrong word. Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe passionate's a better yeah, word passionate. because it's not like you're, you're you're flipping people off in traffic. Or I mean, some no. of your music's angry, the she hard stuff. Yeah, but for sure. I've never thought I'd never describe you as an angry person. No, no, and well, and maybe it's because I do have that cathartic outlet of playing in a really, you know apocalyptically heavy rock band. <laughs> I get to scream all that out yeah. so that when I'm shopping at New World. I'm, I'm not so angry. <laughs> <laughs> Why is everything so expensive? Yeah, totally. <laughs> Tell me about it. Okay, so um, so she had um, the, you named the band after th this is this is funny given what happened in America like decades later. Totally. So you watched a movie called June. Yep. And that, so you're how old at the time? Like seventeen, eighteen? Yes, I'd say 16, 16, 17. Uh, still at school, till still at high school. Or watched it and went, you know, the, 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 you know, it's based on the Frank Herbert novel *June*, the science fiction movie. Uh, but I didn't realise that Frank Herbert had basically based it around a lot of Muslim sort of, an, a, a, you know, Arabic culture. And so he used uh, for the battle at the end. They said it was the Shihad, you know, and we were like, "That's a cool name for a speed metal band, a massive apocalyptic battle." Not realizing that it came from the Arabic term jihad, jihad which means struggle, and uh, which was later co-opted by you know more political wings or, or branches of Islam for you know bad mm -hmm. things like blowing up the World Trade Center and stuff like yeah. that. So it, it is a word that means struggle, which when I look back on Shihad's career, it's quite apt. But at the time, we just thought it was a good name for a speed metal band. I totally misspelled it. Um, I didn't realise it was a J. Went S H, so spelled it phonetically, and then and then stole the Motorhead logo font, and then wrote it in the Motorhead logo font on the back of my jean jacket, and we were away. And that was it. Didn't think about it until I, was, I, I think I woke up in a hotel in L A. when I was twenty six and went, "My God, I'm in a band called Holy War. It's ridiculous, <laughs> you know." But at the same time, by that point, we'd already created two or three really cool records. And got this following, and, and she were a brand at that. Yeah, point. she had meant something else, you yeah, know, so, yeah. to us. So yes, um, yeah, didn't think about. I mean, well, who would have predicted what was going to happen? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, it's know. an amazing twist of events. Yeah. Even even down to you being Muslim now. Absolutely, yourself, like absolutely. It's this complete full circle sort of thing. It's crazy. Did it annoy you in the early years, or even now when people call it she had? Oh, she it, had. That, she, had. She, she had in in Australia straight away. That's mm. just they. It's just the accent, you know. So she had sounds more relaxed, I suppose, but it was she hard. I mean, mm. that was that was what we that was what we named it. Uh, Were you precious about it early on? I, I, no, I didn't care. Oh. All I wanted was for people to come to the shows and and give me a give me an audience, and we'll blow them away. You mm. know, that was the idea. So, um, when did you when did you realize you were onto something special? Was it quite early on? Um, I think we were um, we were classic heavy metal kids, total dweebs out of the social circles. I mean, I had a bit of a social circle going because I played cricket, uh, so I had a bit of a sport thing going on, but once I decided that music was my jam, I was just, basically I was one of those kids that was, lunchtime was spent at the music room, using the amps and the guitars. After school, if we can get it, even in the weekend, if we get the key off the music teacher, we were in there, and we were rehearsing and practicing, and we just wanted to be tight. And it was interesting, we were like, we were not interested in being musicians to go to the parties or score chicks or blah, blah, blah. We were interested in being as tight as we possibly could. And how do the, how, how come international bands sound much, so much bigger than you know local acts and what are they doing? We were on that journey straight away and I was really fortunate to find three like-minded individuals 
that were that passionate about Parallel, it. We mentioned the Beatles before. Parallels there, right? Yeah, I think, I mean, people get, you know, there's so many talented, I mean, like, I do a lot of mentoring in high schools for the New Zealand Music Commission, and there are heaps of talented kids. Mm. But to get a group of pe people that, you, you're not, you're not going to agree on every record, but you're going to agree on the fact that I want to do this with my life. Let's find out how to do it. How are records made? How are great live shows performed? How do you get tight? Oh, you just do it over and over and mm. over and over. And there's no quick way of doing it. You just got to do the hours, you know, 10,000 hours or whatever it is, you know. But you do need to do that, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you a fan of that? That's um, Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, from I, think book it's out. A, I think it's actually yeah. a real truism, you know. It's like, and, 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 and as you get older, you realize, oh, life's actually really short. Mm. And it, you can't be an expert in all the fields, mm. but you can be a, a ninja in one, you know, <laughs> if you dedicate your life yeah. to that, you know. And, and that, I reckon there's a real honour to that, finding what you're, and finding what you're passionate about. I, I know, I thought everyone just knew what they were passionate about. I didn't realise until I was older that, oh, not everyone gets lucky with that as well. I was, I was so into music at the age of two or three that my teeth would be black from the from the rubber casing of the record player because I just lean my teeth and watch watch the records go around while I was listening to music and my my mum would just be like horrified because my teeth would be turning black from the <laughs> the black rubber of where I just rest my teeth just watching because to me it was alchemy it was like how was that sound coming out that needle off that bit of thing going around and then coming out through the speakers and making the sound it was like so that was my calling straight away it was like I want I want to know how they do that. You know, like well, so, so, yeah, so music was still like your North Star, but it took, yeah, you talk about the cricket and the success you had with cricket, so it true. took you a long time to sort of find it. Yeah, I, I suppose, I think it was, it, to, for me, it wasn't, it wasn't a believable sort of... Dream or career path. Well, it was like, I, I loved music, but it, to actually do it for a living, I, I didn't believe that until I met Tom, who made me believe. Tom is very convincing. He's the, he's the son of a... Tom, for those people who don't know, Tom Larkin is our drummer, she has drummer, and also a driving force behind the band. He was the son of a, 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 a diplomat. Um, the, his dad was the New Zealand ambassador to Japan, so he grew up in Japan, uh, f formative years. But he had a real internationalist sort of vibe as well. You know, so I had parents from you know other countries, so it wasn't just about New Zealand, it was always about the whole world. We didn't want to make, we didn't want to just be the best band in New Zealand, we want to be the best band in the world you mm. know so you know whether or not you achieve that but that was our goal you know so we had that sort of outlook and yeah and, and you worked bloody hard like 150 shows in the first couple of years yeah man. first year first, first couple year of years. and then and then yeah and even more in other years i mean it's and that is where you get good mm. again That's, again parallels with like the beatles and their hamburg absolutely. their hamburg shows there's, there's no way they would have written all those great songs and been able to harmonize like they did live because mm. they were all doing those tracks live without doing those 10,000 hours, you know, mm. that's where it came from. Yeah, and then, um, so your first album, Tune, yep. um, that came out 31 years ago, you recorded that in a week. We did. Which is astonishingly quick. When you when you look back on that um, now as a, as a man in your 50s, um, do you look and go, actually, that's that's quite good work, or do you, your toes cool a little no, bit no, at no, some no, of no. the lyrics? Or well, no, uh, well, so we had to uh, uh, we had to perform that album live at the end of last year for, to, for the, oh, to the raise BFM money gig. for the B, yes. for BFM. And uh, I, I was like, okay, yeah, that, yeah I, I like that challenge. That's good. And then listening to it and going, oh, wow, what am I playing there, man? It's like so long ago. Um, but it was a really nice deep dive because I'm always looking forward. I'm never looking back. I never, I mean, that, you know, you said before Music Hall of Fame. It's like, I remember when they rung me to say, Music Hall of, you've got the Music Hall of Fame. I was like, really? I, I still feel young. I'm still I'm still thinking about the next album, you know. Like I was I was like sort of slightly offended, but sort of you know and, and honoured. Yeah. But but um but so so to look back and do a deep dive into a record you made 33 years previously, it's a really interesting challenge. Your physicality is different. We were 21 year old men or 22 year old men, so we we're playing really fast and we it's really tribal and rhythmic. But it was great learning it. And yeah, there were some lyrics where I went. Oh man, I wish I'd, I'd lived a little <laughs> bit more before I wrote that. Yeah, but yeah. but there were still like four or five songs where I go, yeah, I can agree with that, mm. you know. 
and um, it's quite cool though. It's like like a photo. It captures a moment in time. Absolutely, they're all yeah. diaries, man. They're all yeah. they're every your diary. Album. Yeah, it is. It's your diary for yeah. the year. You know. I was going to ask you if you have a favourite She Hard album, but I'm, I, I, from what you've just said, you probably suffer from um, recency bias. I always do, of yeah, course, yeah. because of that, that's that's the because I the way we do it is we make a record. I consume it like a kid in a candy store, like listen to it way more than the other kids, the other guys in the band. And I just like use it all up mm. and then I can never listen to it again because I've just, I've just pigged out on it basically. Mm. So, I mean, cause it, to me it's like, cool. I, I just want to surround myself in what I'm actually thinking at the time. Cause it helps me make sense of the world. So mm. I just use it all up and then I move on to the next thing. Now, how do I see the world? And what have I been listening to that makes me think about things differently? Or what speech have I seen that's make me think differently, you know? So, yeah, I do have um, recency bias. That's <laughs> a, I've never heard that term. That's yeah, yeah, someone totally introduced that to me because pe people ask me all the... I've done like a, over a hundred of these podcasts now. People say, oh, what's your favourite? And it's like, it's always inevitably one that's happened like in the past month. Yes. Because um, you're yeah, feeling it. Yeah. I, I always thought that was a... When I was doing radio interviews and you'd have like, say... Tom Cruise on or Ed Sheeran and you'd ask him favourite song favourite movie whatever they'd always say that it was an eye roll thing it was like oh for fuck's sake you know of give, course give me an honest single. answer don't say Mission Impossible 4 yeah yeah but I sort of understand single. it now it's totally. like whatever you work on at the moment you think it's the best thing you've you, you've done and you've been there and done that with all the other stuff you know so you, you, your feelings different for it but in saying that I think I think the first two records that are really solid for you know uh, especially Killjoy because we self-produced that it's quite a unique sound that could have only come out of, I think, growing up in New Zealand, watching flying nun bands like, you know, The Skeptics or Headless Chickens or Bowder Space, and then mixing it in with a sort of 90s sort of industrial metal thing that we loved, you know, Ministry and Nine Inch Nails, and, and then also being introduced by the people in those bands to things like my bloody valentine and realizing oh you can make a wall of sound and it can actually be like a big warm hug as well as being an assault and that album wouldn't have existed without our upbringing in new zealand you know mm. like so i think that's a cool record i think general electric's a great pop record um for what we were doing um and meeting garth richardson who produced that record of a guy from vancouver who made the first rage against the machine album made us believe that we could make internationally sounding records that was a really good uh, insight into oh how do you make those big mm. big rock rock records and that was really cool but i do think old gods i mean yeah yeah recency by <laughs> old gods for a band that's 33 years down the track sounds vital to me yeah. and it sounds fresh and it's like I wish it was a 21 year old band doing that mm. but that's where i'm at you know like uh, that's that's the rock music i want to hear you mm. know so i do yeah recency bias I, I i love how passionate you are just about it it's um it's a blessing and a curse eh? i think having a like a growth mindset where you just yeah. want to keep keep going keep going yeah, keep yeah. pushing forward but it's um it may, sometimes it, it's, it's a curse in the respect that sometimes it means you don't get to like sit back and celebrate yeah your successes because yeah. you're always looking at what's next yeah and, and I, I think that's good, though. I think mm. it's I think it's it's good because it, it keeps you engaged in the world. You know, like why I don't want to surround myself. I, I don't want to create a little church of Johnny and oh, well done, Johnny, you've done great. <laughs> it's like that, well, that's the end, isn't yeah, it? I yeah. mean, that's well, I might as well just die at that yeah. point. I'm not going to do that. I, I really, I'm staying curious. I want to I want to know how I can help. I want to know how I can make music that's different and, and vital to me, that speaks to me as a 52-year-old man. Mm. And, um, yeah, it's, it's it's exciting. It means that every day is exciting. Yeah. You know? Oh, no, we'll get into this, but it's like, um, yeah, you're doing solo stuff now under your own name. You've done stuff with the adults and yep. a, a whole lot of other projects and bits and pieces. So I feel like you're more immersed in the music business than what you ever have been before, and you're just, like, opening yeah. all these different doors. Yeah, and, and, you know, I mean, with the adults, it's like, first album I get to work with basically my heroes it's like writing lyrics with Shane Carter from Straight Jacket Fits awesome mm. I used to go and watch those guys at, at um, uh, Paisley Park and, and Wellington go whoa it's like a wall of guitar amazing and he was just such an amazing front person so now that I'm sort of a friend of his it's 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 still really exciting to me it's mm. cool and I and he's a great lyricist you know working with Lady Six totally different life experience totally different way of approaching music but still it made me go all oh, right but they're still singing about the same things 
but just with a different vocabulary. Mm. And so it's really great. Second album, I get to work with traditional Sudanese female musicians in Khartoum who are who are basically just making music with their voices and rhythmic in- instruments and just singing about what it's like to live in that city. But then it was still really, I don't know, it g- gave me the same feeling as, this may sound ridiculous, but of listening to Joe Strummer singing in The Clash, you mm. know, it was like protest music, you know, but like from people that are probably from the rougher side of the neighborhood who who are talking truth to power. And I just, mm. it, it's a universal thing, you know, like, so that was really eye-opening for me. And, um, you know, then bringing that music back to New Zealand and, and working with, you know, people like Jess B or Astair or Aradna and, and seeing what parallels there were with their experiences to these women in Khartoum and seeing how it all meshed together. It was like, wow, this music's awesome, you know? Mm. Like, so I, I just love playing with the art, you know? It's it's, it's an art form and um, I know, you know, we, we've we made some pop music and stuff like that, but it's still, it's all art, you know? I mean, I like Taylor Swift because she's an artist who makes amazing pop music, you know? You know, there's an art to doing that yeah. too, you know? Um, but yeah, so anything that's to me sounds like it's got the right intention behind it or is real or honest, uh, that's what I'm attracted mm. to. Yeah, we're working with all these different people. Have you, uh, you, are you familiar with imposter syndrome? Have you ever ha- had that or are you are you quite oh, without, self-assured and quite comfortable now? No, no I, I definitely think getting, the, the, there's what, that's the one good thing about getting old. You've <laughs> become more comfortable in your own yeah, skin. Yeah. Um, Agree. You, you realise that everyone's just as insecure as you are. So when you walk into those parties with all the famous people or whatever, it's like, you know they're all like freaking out before they get there. And, and once you work that out, life becomes a bit easier, you yeah. know. And also, you know, even becoming a parent, that teaches you as well, I think. You know, it's like, right, oh, right, parents are just people, cool. Mm. I'm just a person, blah, blah, blah. I still feel 18 in my head even though I'm 52. Oh, so they must have done that too, you know. So I just, um, I don't know, I've got a lot more time for other people's stories, I think, now. I was when I was young. It was all about shihad, and it was all about what I wanted in the world. What, what you know? Nowadays, it's more like I actually find it way more interesting hearing other people's stories, and that's inspiring to me to go and then write a song, you know, rather than going, "Oh, what does Johnny think?" You know, I know what I think. You know, mm. I want to hear what other people think, and mm. you know, that's how I stay engaged. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I agree with that about aging. It's like, um, yeah, that's one 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 good thing that comes with it. When you're younger, you think. You're so self-conscious. You think everyone's oh, talking about you, everyone's yeah. thinking about you. And as you get older, you realise, well, no, everyone's just thinking about themselves. Everyone's thinking exactly <laughs> what you just said. Everyone's yeah. doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, um, and it's yeah. And so usually when I meet, uh, m- meet people at the top of the food chain, they're probably the most insecure. Mm. That's what's happened, you know, whenever I've met. It's, it's interesting, like when we've played with international acts, it's actually the, um, it, it's, 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 um, I actually have worked out that arrogance can actually be, it, it, it's actually a, it's a cover for really deep-seated insecurity. Mm. So sometimes I'll give people a pass for that behaviour because I actually know that underneath there there's, there's a whole pit of self-loathing. Mm. And, and um, so, but but if, if it's affecting other people badly, I, I'd, I'd probably call mm. it out. But, um, but yeah, it's interesting because out of all the international acts we've played with, it's usually the biggest ones like like uh black sabbath or acdc who are the most relaxed because nothing to prove nothing to prove apart from the fact that they're in acdc like so or 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 they're in black sabbath so tony iommi would turn up an hour an hour and a half before he had to play he'd be warming up because he's tony iommi in black sabbath and he took it serious it's work ethic Mm. it's all about the show it's not about the glory you know it's about the glory is the show Mm. the glory is being in black sabbath and and people walking away from that show going, fuck, man, that band is dope, you know? Mm. That's the glory. It's not about, well, check out me, this photo of me with, you know, Britney Spears or, or at this party or <laughs> blah, 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 or hanging out with Rich Benson. That's not the glory. You know, the glory is the show and is the art, you know? Mm. And, and I think those two bands were really good to, for us to play with. It's like, it just made us know that we we're on the right path. Mm. It's like, yeah, it's not about showing off. It's about... It's about being awesome, you know. But did, did you get to meet Britney Spears? 
No, I, <laughs> no, no, no. I, 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 I was all hypothetical. I, 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 hypothetical. I, I, je- I, je- I jammed with Tara Reid, who was like a sort of like a Z grade sort of Britney Spears. She played drums. She was in that movie, Josie and the Pussycats. That's the sort of thing that happens when you're living in LA for six months. You end up meeting. Uh, okay, way less impressive. No further yeah. questions about Tara Reid. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, yeah. So since you mentioned ACDC, yeah, let's talk about some of these bands that you open with. So ACDC, you've opened for them a number of times over the years. Yeah. So I'm guessing you. You've you've um, met or maybe even friends with the different Phil Rudds. Phil Rudd, like twenty years ago, was also, very different to the the Z yeah. Phil Rudd now. Yeah. So Phil was the guy that actually said we should get she hard. So I I always take my hat off to to Phil and 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 I know he's had some hard times and um, he seems good now though, right? Yeah, I haven't seen him recently. So, but yeah, I mean, I just think he went it was hanging out in the wrong crowd basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so, also, I, I, don't, I don't even know the guy, but I'm guessing like too much money and just bored. Yeah, bored, and also it's really hard to come down off that high of being on the road and playing in front of forty thousand people a night or whatever, and then come back to normal everyday life mm. because you just your body's used to these shots of adrenaline that are just not happening. I'm sure that happens with sports people as <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and it's like that's why a lot of them fall into drug and alcohol problems mm. because. Because they're not, they're trying to fill that hole, that void that's just not there mm. in everyday life. It, it, and it, I think for me, I, I think having children made me look at the smaller things and, and go, all right, there's a whole universe there. You know, like, so yes, I still do miss that thrill of, because it is like jumping out of an airplane, playing in front of 30,000 people or whatever, you know, it's like, it is the best feeling ever. You know, in fact, supporting ACDC at Western Springs. And that was like 62,000 people. I was so nervous before I walked on stage, my eyeballs were shaking inside my, my brain, you know. It was like, and then I get out there and I wouldn't have wanted to be any pla- other place in the universe. It's the, it was the centre of the universe. And it was like, this is the best feeling in the world, you know. So um, it's, 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 a, it's a hyper real situation that your body sort of gets used to. So it's, it's hard to, to equal a mm-hmm. real, you know. I don't know the word. It's uh, hard to you know find a balance when you when you're back in normal life, even though life really isn't that normal. Mm. You know, it's all weird. Yeah, after doing a show like that, how do you how do you, like how do you how do you decompress? How do you wind down? Oh, I towel down then went and watched my favorite band ACDC. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> Because <laughs> I saw a photo of you on, on um, Facebook just recently doing, um, I think it was the Meat Stock mm. Festival, and there's a massive crowd there. Mm. Um, yeah, do, like, do you do you still do you party after a show, or do you just uh, uh, what do you what do you do nowadays? No, no, no. I, I don't don't tend to party. I, I tend to like what I like doing is I like playing music. Mm. That's that's my jam. That's the party, you know. So I always have acoustic guitar around. I usually just like use that adrenaline to either talk to people, meet people. I really like meeting people. I haven't drunk for 12 years, so I don't need that. Is uh, that a I, Muslim thing? or Yeah, that is yeah. from converting. Um, yeah, we don't drink alcohol, but I mean, I don't really miss it. I was never a massive drinker. I mean, I'm a sort of person that if I'm going to go, I go large. So so when I did drink, I'd drink hard. Mm. And and I'm, I'm, I wasn't a fighty guy because I'm far too skinny for that. But I, I'd be a property damager, so I'd end up, <laughs> I'd, I'd end up jumping on roofs of cars until they caved in and stuff like that. So it was really not that cool. So, um, so I just, I haven't missed that. But I, what it means is that you're really discernible about conversations you're having afterwards. If someone's too drunk, it, all of a sudden it's all about them. So I'm not really interested mm. in that. So I'm just like, okay, I'm going to the toilet. But, but you do have really interesting conversations and you got, I, I find I'm sometimes I'm the last person standing because I'm not drinking, mm. you know, because I got energy, you know, like I find my energy's higher, you know, like, cause you don't get into that big sloggy mess, you know, and they don't wake up the next day going, fuck, did I say something stupid? Yeah, what did I say? What property yeah, did I damage yeah, this yeah, time? Exactly. <laughs> you know, so I don't have that issue. I don't have headaches in the morning. Great. Yeah. So um, that's cool. But yeah, I usually end up playing. I mean, like I just played it, uh, Wild Foods Festival down in Hokitika. Uh, it was amazing. Mm. And it was I, I ended up befriending a, a sort of country band called the Harmonic Resonators, basically a family from the Waikato. And um, really lovely. We just ended up back in a hotel room, just songs, stories till one o'clock in the morning with all harmonising vocals with, uh, you know, like the parents were like in their 60s right down to the youngie sort of 18-year-old guitar player 
and we'd just like I'd play him one of my new songs they'd play me one of these and then we'd play a Neil Young song then they'd do a, a country standard but in Te Reo, I mean that for me is the perfect night out after a gig you know like just music it's just music you know and shit you're in a good place aren't you yeah it's cool man I love it mm. I love it I love music you know I love humans yeah you know and and, and um yeah I love aging as well like I'm, yeah. I'm one year younger than you <clears throat> I'll be, I'm exactly the same. Like there's, there's, there's nothing. Yeah, I mean, you can get away with being a property damager in your twenties. Yeah. If you're a, a dude in your fifties doing it, it's kind of lame. It's just it's, it's embarrassing. It's, it's really embarrassing. It's yeah. really lame. And also, I just I've just seen too many of my friends like, um, yeah, smash themselves so hard they either die, <clears throat> or they or they they end up living alone and it's a really it's sad it's sad mm. you know and i i was just early on i was like i do not want to do that mm. and because i had children later in life i was 40 when my first son was born um i've got to stick around you know mm. and i want to be there to watch them as long as i possibly mm. can so that means looking after myself you know it's a it's a tough one man mm. it's like it's that's like it's all a way of not looking at yourself Ultimately, it's like running away from yourself yeah. for as long as you possibly can. <laughs> uh, but ultimately, those chickens are going to come to home to mm. roost. Or if they don't, you're going to kill yourself. Mm. You know, like, and you've got, I, and I totally understand why people do it because it's pain management, it's self management, because it, life is tough, you know? Mm. Life is tough. And we've all got traumatic experiences from our childhood, and we've all got, you know, things that hold on to us and crazy ideas about the world and crazy ideas about ourselves that we're constantly battling. But I actually found that it was easier to, to face them head on if I was straight. And I think that comes from the fact that when She Hard first started, because as we go back to the start of this interview, we were total nerds about being the tightest band, mm. being the best band. How do you do that? So we, when we were first started, we experimented with every drug known to man, LSD, uh, mushrooms, cactus, uh, pot, alcohol, everything. And we'd, what we'd do is we'd record it on video and then watch it back when we were straight and go, well, that was shit. <laughs> Even if we thought it was good at the time and we're laughing on stage, we'd watch it and have the evidence and go, that's not good. And then so we basically went, the only way we can play is to play straight, be completely sober. And that makes it even more scary. You know, it's like, wow, this is quite an unreal situation. Mm. It's like jumping out of a plane really sober, you know, and it's like, it, it, but it means that the rush is actually bigger, mm. you know, because it's like, whoa, I'm seeing it for what it is, mm. you know, like, so, and then we'd, and then you can reward yourself afterwards. Mm. Um, obviously, Phil, our guitarist, had a little turn with finding, you know, Dutch courage and alcohol, but he sorted that out. Yeah, actually, yeah, we'll get to this shortly, but your um, movie that came out, which is incredible, it's it's actually on YouTube, you can watch it for free now, Beautiful yep. Machine, Yeah, um, came out in 2012, yeah, Phil talks about, um, there was like a band intervention, like he was getting wasted to perform as a, like a mask, and the, the you other three guys like sat him down and said, hey bro, this has got to stop, and credit to him, he did stop. He did, he went and had, went straight to AA, and then he still does, mm. you know, I mean, and it's 20 plus years, mm. and he's been sober. And um, and I think his life's so much more improved mm. because of it. You know, his relationships are better. Um, he's got two kids now. They love him. He loves them. And he, when he does play, he's amazing. He's a great guitar player. Mm. And I think he plays better now than he ever did. Mm. And he's completely facing it head on. You know, and straight. And this is a guy that, when we first saw him play, he was in the Onslow College High School rock band. Uh, and he spent the whole show with his back turned to the audience because he couldn't face the audience. But he loved music. And that's the thing about this 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 art. It's like it, it attracts really sensitive human beings and then puts them in a really mm. un, unusual situation, you know? Like, it's such an interesting story. I, yeah. I, th I think I heard the same thing about Dobbin when, yeah, he, right. when he started out with the dudes. Yeah, I could imagine. Same thing, back yeah. to the crowd. Yeah. <laughs> because it's not, like, not a great stage presence. <laughs> yeah, because you're just, it's like, whoa, all these people are looking at me. And yeah. you, you'd spent your whole school life trying to be invisible, you know, or dodge, the, dodge it all. And all of a sudden you're going, look at me, look at me. Because, I mean, we're on a stage mm. with a whole bunch of lights and a big PA. Mm. So, of course, you're saying, look at me. But it's, he was attracted to the music, then had to deal with what came with that, right. you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so this beautiful machine, uh, the She Hard movie, um, 
a big sort of central part of that is the American experience. Mm. Um, so, so when was when was, so um, the Twin Towers thing, the um, yeah, the the terrorist, terrorism attacks in mm. the states that was um, September 11, two thousand and one. Yeah. When were you guys uh, trying to break the American market? So we literally uh, were two weeks when that happened. We were living in LA. Only we'd only been there for two weeks. Uh, starting our pre-production with a producer called Josh Abraham and um, and that's ha- and that happened and um, I think Carl had actually already he was that happened while Carl was in a plane flight back to New Zealand because his grandmother was very ill so he had to go home mm-hmm. so it was just me Phil and Tom and uh, and I, I was. We were in the Oakwood Apartments. For anyone who doesn't know what an Oakwood Apartments is, it's basically where all the people trying to make it they stick them in this place called the Oakwood Apartments, <laughs> a beige hotel nightmare, right? And it's like I'm I, at that place. I hung out with the guy who played Jar Jar Binks, met Malcolm in the Middle, blah blah blah. <laughs> you know, it's just it's the sort of place that that happens at. You know, but I just I remember wait, being woken up by Tom one morning in this apartment. It's like, turn on the TV, World War Three's just started. <laughs> and I turn on the TV, second plane goes into the World Trade Centre. So I instantly think, Tom's saying the truth, World War Three started. Mm. It was a crazy day. It was a crazy day. So I basically ran, first thing I did was run down to the 7-Eleven, buy a pack of cigarettes, because I'd given up again at that point, <laughs> after uh, two years, and then I went straight back, I need a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> World War Three started. I think I had one Valium left from uh, from from some medication. <laughs> took that, uh, and then went right. What the fuck are we doing? Let's go home. But we couldn't go home because mm. all the flights were grounded all around the world. You know, so we basically had to, yeah, be in America while they were dealing with what had just happened to them. And every time you'd be walking down the street and you hear a car backfire, everyone's like, oh, running into shops, mm. and uh, and then all the f- American flags went up on the on the thing, and everyone rallied round the president who at the time was George Bush and and it was it was really interesting to watch the psychology of that country just shift and uh, into a sort of more warlike mode mm. and uh, and be trying to make a record after trying to crack that market so from when we were first kids because I mean it's the home of like so many bands I love you know it's like Metallica and Slayer and especially at that time and it was like we want to go there you know like it's where it's the home of metal and the home of rock, and well, it's such a big market as well. Oh, it's well, yeah. We weren't thinking that. We just wanted to be. We wanted to go there and prove to all these people in America that we were just as good as that. You know, like that's that was what it was. Uh, probably our management were thinking it was a bigger market. It was mm. great, but um, we just wanted to go to the home of rock and roll and, and be a great rock and roll mm. band. You know, so so we were there. I mean, but but we younger when we were younger signed a terrible contract with a, a german metal label called noise records who we signed with because they had they'd signed bands like creator and a few speed metal bands that we loved and so it's like yeah we signed to noise records and uh but it ended up being a nightmare it was just like you can't you can't be released unless it's by us in america but they didn't have any way of releasing us in america for three albums so we had to mm. give them three albums which it's about five six years until we could then go and shop ourselves in America. So we finally got out of that contract, signed this thing with a, produ- with a production company, and then went over to start this big thing, and, and then that happened, and it was like, oh my gosh. Mm. Yeah, and it, was, it became more apparent over the six months that we were making that record, when I'd go shopping at Ralph's, which is their version of New World, um, uh, and some dude would go, oh, you look like you're in a band. Be like, yeah, yeah, I'm in a band. What's the name of your band? Oh, she had, and it was like the literally <laughs> eyes would glaze over and they'd walk off, and it was like, oh yeah, right, this is not going to fly. Well, yeah, the, the irony being, going back to the beginning, the movie June, <clears throat> totally, yeah, where it's um, yeah, you you named the bad band she had after you, what was actually jihad, so it's yeah. exactly the same same thing. So then, um, but you 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 dug your heels and no, you didn't want to change the band name, like you. Dug my heels in for about six months. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I remember coming back and doing a big day out. I remember um, Mike Patton from Faith No More, who we'd toured with in Europe pr- prior to that, come up to me and went, Johnny, if you change your name, I'm going to find you. I'm going to fucking slit your throat. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then um, the guy from A Tribe Called Quest coming up and saying, hey, man, I don't know, man, but 
in Arabic that means struggle and that's a good name I think you should keep it and it's like yeah yeah cool cool and then Peter Hook you know bass player from fucking Joy Division and New Order mm. saying to me I actually understand why you'd have to change your name mm. you know like I mean that's just not gonna fly mm. here have a line of coke <laughs> <laughs> So all yeah. these ridiculous situations that I found myself in. But, you know, we were the ones who had to make that decision. I was, it was basically me and Carl saying, nah, Tom and Tom, who's definitely more business minded, going, this isn't going to work unless we change our name. And Phil, who was just mortally fearful of touring the southern states of America with a name like she had, he's got a massive, he's got massive anxiety. So he was like, I don't want to be shot mm -hmm. on stage. And I thought, Initially, oh, that's just over the top. But oh, it's America, being yeah. in America, <laughs> yeah, Confederate like, flag states, you never know. So it became more and more apparent if we wanted to try that American dream, we would have to make some compromise. And mm -hmm. Pacifier at that point was the biggest song that we'd ever had. And we just went, oh, man, at least it's got some sort of thing to us. And it was just, I just felt awful about the whole thing. It just was like, well, it's like asking someone at, you know, 26 years old John you are now Xavier or you know John you've got to change your name to something else mm. it's like no that's my name you know like so but I caved finally and um, I regretted it instantly you know like I, I didn't did you just didn't sit comfortably with you no I didn't no. it didn't sit comfortably with me but I did understand why at the same time you know like mm. I told it, it, there was a logic to it feels like a, a lose-lose situation eh? like was. you're damned if you do damned if you don't yeah I think on that movie I say shit A or shit B. I mean, it literally was, <laughs> that was the line. options, you know, and it was like, it was no, there was no easy answer. There was no mm. historical context we could look back and go, mm. oh, that happened to The Who, uh, but it didn't, you yeah. know, it never happened to any other band, you know. Y yeah, yeah, there's no blueprint. There's no blueprint, so we had to make it up as we went along. Yeah. Management were pushing hard, record company pushing hard, production company pushing hard, booking agents pushing hard for a change when you've got that many sort of knowledgeable people knowledgeable with um air commas um mm. saying it's the right thing to do then i yeah i can see why you eventually cave i we think did. you probably did well to dig your heels in for six months i did and the i, I think i did and then mm. and then ultimately it was two years mm. of going okay because this band whether that was a good or bad decision it was i i you know it was what it was we're really good when we're the underdogs mm. And I think some of the best shows we ever played was when we were under the name Pacifier because we'd have a whole crowd going, she hard, she hard, you know, like, which is cool. And, but it was like, we wanted to prove that we were still that shit kicking band, you know. And we had a couple of great songs on that record as well. Like Run is a really a good classic, record yeah. and, and Comfort Me is a great song. Um, but yeah, so it was, we basically really kneecapped ourselves and we had to work hard to to win people back you know oh yeah in, in terms of like new zealand and australian audience yeah new zealand or? and australia which is which is where we were predominantly right. known and in england as well before that happened we just sold out the ocean and downtown london it was massive mm. and it was like and then we had to change our name and mm. it's like a, a branding nightmare from a business perspective <laughs> you know like it was it was like you'd built this this name and all the experiences that went along with it over 20 whatever years and then just went now we're now mm. this you know so it was just it was it was hard work I th yeah but do you think um i mean if the american experience was different and it had worked and it had been wild successful you'd look at it differently now or? well i'll tell you this story this is this is a story when i met um Mark McGrath from Sugar Ray. You remember that mm, Yeah, of Sugar course, Ray. yeah. Now, I, I just want to fly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I would have expected to have really disliked that guy because I didn't like his music. But that's never the case. <laughs> usually the bands that you hate are usually the nicest. You guys. and me are very different. I was a big Sugar Ray fan. Yeah, well, I, I didn't like them at all. So I meet Mark McGrath and he instantly goes, he breaks the ice by going, hey, Johnny, I bet you hate my band. And I was like, oh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I just liked him from that moment on, and we got on so well. And he said to me, I've heard you play me your songs, and, and I played him things like um, Walls, off, which went on Pacifier, and all these songs I was writing on acoustic guitar. And he went, wow, this, this, this country's going to break you, man. And I, mm. I was like, what? He goes, I was like, why did you say that? And he goes, because they're beautiful songs. 
but this is a really ugly world and a really ugly industry and you've got to be tough you know and you're a sensitive dude and he was the he was the one he wasn't trying to put me off it but he's he was warning home me. truths yeah yeah he was warning me and and in in a way if that record had taken off i'm not sure if i'd still be here you know like here is and what i might have been dead you know right. like it might have broken me it might have made me totally disillusioned with the world i mean you saw what it did to kurt cobain mm. you know saw what it did to amy winehouse yeah there's a reason why sensitive talented human beings get crushed by that mm. industry because it's tough man mm. it's like art meeting commerce boom boom mm. boom and it crushes you you know and it was just i just i always think about that conversation i had with him and it, he wasn't he wasn't discouraging me he was he was a fan he loved the, the songs but he said be careful you mm. know like and i think that's i think i think he was right yeah, yeah. And the um the, so the Viper Room show um yeah <laughs> this is amazing Classic. so on the <laughs> you just did an eye roll uh, so on the your beautiful machine doc so Viper Room's famous club in um, sort of Melrose area of Hollywood area of LA it's where Rip Rip Phoenix, Phoenix died. passed away yeah. outside yeah uh, him and Anthony Kiedis used to hang out there all the time it was yep. like a I think it was Johnny Depp's club loved it so you guys had like an industry showcase concert there so it's uh, um, pacifier on stage yeah and just a whole lot of um, executives. Um, yes, so what's the purpose of that? Is it just to basically shop you around to find a label that's going to sign you? Absolutely it was. Yeah. So there was lots of people from different record companies going, this is the latest darling of this production company, let's have a look. And they were, they'd heard some songs, so there was talk of lots of money in that room. And the night before that show, I'd uh, talked to my friend John Zuko, who was a and at Polygram Records, which is no longer... Uh, in in Australia, now John Zuko is a funny motherfucker, but he's very Australian, and he told me that joke, uh, the police horse joke, right? <laughs> Which I, as a Kiwi, thought was hilarious. Yeah. Hey, by the way, I'll stop you right there. So, uh, yeah, there was there's some technical difficulties on stage. So there's a moment of sort of like dead air or whatever you want to call. Yeah, it. basically, yeah, my guitar's uh, out of tune. Yeah. We're using a different guitar tech. We're all like, you know, we'd but the the production company had like manicured us, put clothes on us, um, told us what the set list is, and some of that set list included me playing acoustic guitar in the middle of a of a Shiard show, right? Should never listen to the record mm. company. The I, I can see company. what they were they were thinking though. Like, um, you know, you're a very very charismatic um, front person, so. They obviously thought this guy's got the star power. Yeah. Let's have a bit of both. Yeah. So, but but the context was, it was only a few months after September the 11th. And um, you could not joke about firemen or police officers because they were the heroes. Yeah, they were you know? held in such high esteem. Absolutely. They were the heroes of 9-11. And I totally understand that. But I was just, the, it was like my guitar's out of tune. I'm standing here like a, a dork. Oh, oh, I heard this great joke yesterday. <laughs> and just not even thinking about the context of where I was or anything. I just thought, oh, this is a funny joke. So I tell the police horse joke. Can I tell it on this? Yes. So the police horse joke is, what's the only animal with a cunt halfway up its back? And and the answer is a police horse. Right? So, <laughs> which is, it's totally ludicrous. It's, and it's really funny. It's especially funny in an Australian accent as well, because it's just so Australian, you know, but, um, but literally after that joke, it just was dead silent. And all these people started moving to the exit. They just walked out and it was like, it's like a scene out of the office or something. Totally. And I'm look over and my bandmates who are, who are waiting to go back on stage, just hiding under towels. <laughs> <laughs> They're hiding under towels going, could I please disappear? You know, like, and I was like, could I please disappear? And it was just the worst. It was the worst night. And then afterwards, all, even our production company just disappeared. And like, we went to the club where they had gone and trying to text them and they weren't answering their phones. Mm. And it was like, oh my God, what have we done? And it was just the worst night. I literally, for about six months afterwards, I could I found it very hard to go to sleep because I'd go and then just think about that moment and go, oh. 
um, what are you laugh about now? I, I uh, emailed you yesterday to say, by the way, I thought the police horse joke was funny, and you replied saying it was a, like a two million dollar joke. Oh, easy, easily two million dollars. Oh. There was bigger figures than that, you know, like being bandied around. It was like burn it in one one. So, day. so the van ride back to the hotel uh, with your bandmates. How does that go? Oh man. They, are you, you apologising? Are they oh, tearing strips off you? Oh, yeah, yeah. They were so angry at me. They were so angry at me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was, yeah, it, it, that, that, that... Can they laugh about it now? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely they can. But, um, and you know what? I, I'm sort of quite zen about it. It's like the universe is protecting me from something there, I reckon. I honestly believe that. Like it's self-sabotage in a way, isn't it? I Maybe honestly yeah. think I wouldn't have done all these interesting things that I did afterwards if, if I'd gotten all I, all my dreams handed me to on a mm. silver platter. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have uh, met all the people I've met. I wouldn't have been married in Khartoum. I wouldn't have you know, worked with these amazing musicians from another part of the world. I wouldn't have done that all. You know? like, I just think, I, I honestly believe that that was the universe going, this path's not for you, mm. you know? And it meant that I've actually done so much more interesting stuff that I would never have imagined doing. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I've got a pretty zen sort of outlook on it. And it, and it, and it is a fucking funny joke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, isn't it funny, though, something that at the time and for evidently six months afterwards can seem like the worst thing in the world. You look back, like, with the benefit of a lot of hindsight, and it's, um, it's, it's a gr great... Part of your tapestry. It's a, a really interesting story, yeah, yeah without absolutely. a doubt, without a doubt. I mean, it's, it, the funny thing is, when when John Zuko told me that joke before he said police horse, I was imagining like either a badger or a skunk with a vagina in its back. <laughs> 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 and I, I just had this weird image, yeah. you know, like, and then it was like, and then he told me the punchline. I was like, mm. Jesus, <laughs> would it have been any better? Would it have suffered if, if you said asshole halfway up its back? Nah, nah, <laughs> nah. Asshole can't. No, nah, no, nah, it just doesn't work. Okay? Same, same. It doesn't work. And so when, when was the last time you saw Beautiful Machine? Uh, probably at the, actually, yeah, no, it was at the premiere. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it was. it's a hard watch for me because it's so, I mean, who, who, who else gets to sit there and look at all the bad fashion choices they've ever made, all the most ridiculous things they've ever said, uh, it's, it's warts and all. It's so warts and all. Who has to, who does that? I had Annie Circus, Gollum, sitting behind me and my mum. And while I'm saying all this ridiculous shit, wearing all this ridiculous shit, it was hard. And it's hard watching all those mistakes put together. But at the same time, it's, it's such a great documentary because of that. Mm. You know, like that's why it's a good movie. Yeah. But I don't need to see it. I've lived it. I've seen it once that's enough you know like yeah i wonder if it's, it would be even harder for you to watch now because um yeah you lost your mum during during absolutely. covid uh, you were, and you were separated by distance um absolutely and she um she, gosh, she she's in all the all the parent all the she hard parents are in this documentary mm. and they're so kind and supportive so, uh, so encouraging of you yeah, guys absolutely i can't imagine how i don't know uh yeah my, thankfully my mum's still alive um but yeah i don't know how that would make me feel if i was in your position watching it now like Probably just sadness, really. Yeah, I, I think it would be hard to watch just mm. because, um, yeah, I, I mean, the circumstance of my... I mean, it, it'd be because both, you know, like I, I lost my dad after that movie was made and then it was hard watching it when it first came out. Mm. But it was sort of like, it's it's like hard but also sort of lovely to see him alive again, you know? Mm. So maybe it would be nice in that way, but it'd be because of the circumstance of my mum's passing, which was basically I was in lockdown in Melbourne and she was in lockdown in Wellington and there was no way I could even get back. So my, my sister had to hold up a phone so I could talk to her and say goodbye. And in fact, because I was the, the, the mummy's boy, her little favourite, she was she held on in a coma for like 13 days. And it was, they got to the point where my brother and sister said, you're going to have to talk to her. So I had to say, mum, you've done a great job we're going to be okay, you can let go. So I was that guy, but I did it over a phone. So that was fucking tough because it, cause you need to be there, you know. You need to be there to see it, to feel it, to know that that person's gone. And to me it still seems quite surreal and almost unreal. Mate, you know? that's brutal. Yeah. I mean, it's only a three-hour flight, but it, you may as well have been on the moon. Absolutely. There was no way through it. I, I mean, it wasn't only a lockdown here, it was a lockdown in Melbourne. So there was, I, my brain was instantly like, oh, if I fly up to Cairns, oh, no, I can't do that. 
because <laughs> all, all the all yeah. the states are closed off to each other as well. So I couldn't even find a way out, and I just had to wear it. And then on top of that, to rub salt into the wound, my my brother and sister held off the memorial for three months so that Melbourne could come into lockdown. We came out of lockdown two days before the memorial, went into lockdown again. So I had to watch that on an iPad, iPhone as well. So um, it was just completely surreal. You know? uh, how did you feel at that time? Just sadness, guilt, oh, anger? Oh, super sad. You know what? Uh, when I fight, because they, they saved some of the ashes for me to take down to Island Bay where we grew up so I could say goodbye. So when I finally did get over... I didn't know how I felt until I was driving out to Island Bay. I could see Island Bay coming up. And then I just started crying. I went, I just felt guilty for not being there. You mm. know, because she really, after Dad passed away, she really relied on me and my wife, Dana, because we, we were gentle with her, gentle with her, and, and took her in and, and made her go, it's okay, you know. And, and we actually took her over to Khartoum, and she came and watched us get married over there. And oh, cool. she, you know, we had a moment where we were standing on the Blue Nile going, Oh, and she turned to me and go, um, Dad would never believe where we are right now, you know, and we were having a cup of tea and I was like, yay, we've got, given her something to look forward to and then mm. her grandson was born and yay and so, so I just felt really guilty that I wasn't there but there was no way I could get there, you know. That was the, that was the biggest feeling was like just guilt, not being there to say it's okay, mm. you know. Yeah, yeah. Should yeah, I'm sure. She, yeah, if there's nothing you can do about it. Should understand. You can see it from this um this movie. Like she's so proud of you. Eh? Yeah, totally. there is just so much, yeah. so much unconditional love. There. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. You know, I've done plenty of therapy with that as well because because great having unconditional love. But Dad was the guy that said, "Pull your fucking head in when you act when I behaved badly or acted like mm. a dick." You know, so I needed that balance. So when Dad passed away, having Mum going, "Oh, there, there, to have a cup of tea, you can do no wrong." Mm. It's almost a little bit tough, you know. Like yeah. it's like because you're not being seen for what you really are, you know. Mm. And, and I, I needed, I needed that dose of reality as well. Yeah. When did? When did what's your relationship with therapy? When did you start having? Oh, I think after. I mean, yeah. I mean, for me, um, I've had bouts with uh, anxiety. Mm. Um, so uh, at the end of General Electric, um, I'd been. We'd been working, we'd played a million shows that year. I'd turned into a rock and roll animal. I was basically throwing guitars at guitar techs because I just wanted the band to be the best band ever. And it was just eyes on the prize. And I was like, I was, but I didn't realise I was burnt out by the end mm. of two years of touring. And I basically walked into a shop down Chapel Street in Melbourne where I was living and walked out of it and thought I was on the other side of the road. I thought I'd, when I'd walked in, I was on the other side of the road. So, and then just had this huge bout of vertigo because it was a real non-reality. But what I was having was a panic attack. I didn't mm. realise. I'd never had one before. And that started a bout of panic attacks, which got really bad. I was also self-medicating with drugs and alcohol, not looking after myself. Ended up basically burning out, coming back to New Zealand. My dad looked after me and my um, first partner. And... Um, yeah, I, I basically had to do therapy through that. I did pull myself through that, and it was good uh, with a lot of help from family and friends mm. uh, and therapy. Um, and then it wasn't till recently um, uh, where I've actually gone to see a cognitive behavioural therapist, but that's for something completely different. That was I got a COVID complication, which turned my tinnitus up to fucking 12. Uh, and that was crazy. And um, What's that, just ringing in the ears? So ringing in the ears, which I'd had since I was 19, because I'm standing next to a fucking loud China symbol playing a loud rock band, but it was always manageable. Go and see a live band, fuck, my ears are ringing real bad. Have a nice, quiet day the next day, almost imperceptible. And then, so uh, I played, I basically caught COVID uh, two weeks after catching COVID, I got woken up out of a dream with a basic car alarm going off in my head. It was like I'd been to see Motorhead and sat my head in the PA, you know, and it was like, but it was like, it was so loud. I was just like, shit, what's going on, man? And then I literally didn't sleep for 36 hours because it was so loud. I ended up in A&E out in, uh, out in an eastern suburb where we were living at the time and they had to give me... Um, yeah, like uh, Valium and Zopiclone to sleep because I couldn't sleep because it was just so loud. And then I went to ear, nose and throat specialist and blah, blah, blah. And it was like one ear, nose and throat specialist said, there's 
there's data coming out of America. If you had pre-existing tinnitus, if you caught COVID, you got a 40% chance of it turning it up. And we don't know how long it sticks around for. I suggest you go and see a cognitive behavioural therapist because nothing I do is going to make it. Because it's the sound's not coming from your ears, it's coming from your brain. So what's happened is I've got, I've got if you look at my the graph of my hearing, because I stand next to symbols and stuff, the top end of all that all the sibilance it's it's been it's been worn out right so covid comes in it decreases your overall volume your brain goes shit he's lost all of his top end hearing i've going to have to turn that up so he doesn't get eaten by a lion it's literally a survival mm. mechanism so my brain's going i'm protecting you here but i've got to then train it to go i'm actually safe and you're actually making my life fucking hell at the moment, you know. So even now I've got it, you know, and it's focused, it's attention based. So if I think about it, it turns it up as well, you know, because I'm it's focus where your focus is. So cognitive behavioral therapy is great because it's basically teaching you to be present, to teaching you not to catastrophize and go shit if it's loud now, my life's gonna be hell and yeah. it's time. <laughs> my career is over. Is, which is there were some dark days in there, yeah. man. I was going. I'm not sure if I can live with this, you know, it was loud. And um, so cognitive behavioral therapy was great because it was not only dealing with that, but it was dealing with any sort of, you know, faulty sort of thought patterns that you've developed at, through your childhood, you know, like things like cup half empty stuff, you know, mm. crystal ball gazing, you know, imagining the worst outcome. Yeah, overthinking, and, catastrophizing. And, 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 yeah, and, and, but, but, but writing a future that's not even fucking real, mm. you know, we all can do it. But if you can identify that you're doing it, it takes the sting out of it mm. and it instantly makes you go, actually, I'm just going to be present right now and the future will be what it's going to be, mm. you know? So it was something that I needed to probably do anyway. Mm. So that's that's my latest bout of therapy. Yeah, a, a therapist I saw, she said, when you're having those thoughts, you should um, ask, and, and you, you catch yourself, you should ask yourself, is this... Um, is this truthful and is this helpful? Yeah, and then try and park it to one side. But Absolutely. fuck, it's easier said than done. But but <laughs> but but I think cognitive behavioural therapy is really good yeah. like that way because it's really it really hones down to well these are tw he's his twelve classic versions of faulty thinking. Do you do you, some people do A and Z, you know C? Some people do all of them. Some people just do one of them. Some but if you can identify that that's what you're doing, you can just step back from yourself, give yourself a breather, go actually that's bullshit. And then just mm. and then just come back to being present, you know, and that's yeah. actually the gift is being present, which is why I'm attracted to music because I've probably always thought like that. And music makes mm. you be present because you can't be anywhere else when you've got, you know, a thousand people in front of you and you're playing this thing and you don't want to fuck up and you're thinking about the story you're telling. You've got to be right there, right then. You can't be thinking about the bills you've got to pay. You can't be thinking about that joke that you told in LA that <laughs> lost you $2 million. You can't, you can't afford to do that. You've got to be right yeah, there. Yeah. And that's why so many sensitive people are attracted to art and music because we micro-focus and we stop worrying about mm. the future and we stop worrying about the past and we, we're right there. You mm. know? And it's a really powerful um, way of of mm. doing mindfulness without having to learn how to meditate or anything yeah. like that, you know? How's, how, yeah, how's your mental health now? How are you today? You good today? Very good. Very, very positive. Um, I, I've sort of worked out mixes with uh, the mixer of my new solo record, which is totally sweet because he's he's nailed it more times than he hasn't and uh, I'm just like trying to focus on putting that whole thing together. Uh, my kids are happy, so I'm happy. My yeah, wife's happy. How old, are the, how old are the kids now? Kids are uh, five and eight, soon to be six and nine. Mm -hmm. So um, they're great. They're at Newton Central School. Very happy there. Mm -hmm. It's only got like 150 kids, and it's right in the middle of town, and such a beautiful school. Mm -hmm. uh, they're you know they're learning the language of the country as well as English, so they're learning Tereo, and it's it's beautiful to watch them. Because they're from two different worlds, you know, mm. like they're, my wife's Sudanese and I'm a Pakeha from New Zealand, you know, son of two British immigrants, totally different worlds coming together and they're beautiful because of that mm. and they're, they're, but they're, um, I think we spent a year out in Howick and we had great neighbours, lovely neighbours, but the school was very predominantly uh, Pakeha. Mm -hmm. So my kids are, are both um, 
biracial and um, I think they my son had long hair so he'd get called a girl and stuff like this and I was like what the fuck is <laughs> does that still happen? it does out in Halleck uh, <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's 2024 for fuck's sake you know and because and we we'd yeah. had such a good experience about his first year at school in Melbourne and um, so I found it quite perplexing that that was happening in my home country so anyway we found uh, a great school in Kingsland uh, called yeah um, Newton Central School and it's they've just flourished and it's mm. just beautiful to watch, you know. And so, yeah, so we're pretty happy, you know. Um, we're, we're very happy. And, and I'm being creative. I'm still writing music and performing. And I'm really, yeah, I'm really in love with music and, and finding new ways around it. So, mm. especially at the moment, you know. And, and because of all the shit that happened during COVID, losing mum, that tinnitus thing happening, um uh, losing my brother-in-law to a really aggressive cancer, um, uh, it was it was a, it was a lot of personal trauma mm. and lots of personal shit. That's uh, yeah, a that's a lot of grief to a lot process, of grief, isn't it? A lot of grief, and so and and also one of the one of the um, one of the things that my cognitive behavioural therapist said was it'd be good if you could meditate, but because of the nature of tinnitus, you can't. So what can what can you do? Play your guitar. It's mindfulness. Mm. So what did I do? Played guitar and wrote and mm. wrote and wrote. And that was my road out of that an anxiety because I was having full-blown panic attacks with this car alarm going off in my head that was out of my seemingly out of my control at the time. I've learned how to control it mm. now. But um, that was my... And it was great because I got to think about mum. I got to think about that feeling I had when I heard that she'd finally passed away and I... I got that almost vertigo feeling of like, oh shit, there's nothing between me and the universe anymore. I'm that, like, I'm the adult now, you know. Like, there's there's no one protecting mm. me from that huge expanse out there, you know. Like, I'm that, I'm that last line of defense, and that's something you have to, you already get get to know that feeling when you lose both your parents, you know, and and, you know, unless you die before them, that's something we all have to face. Yeah, but it was it was a good way to put it into music is just poetry is a great way to to understand that you know mm. like, and understand why you're feeling that or you know yeah 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 and, and it is poetry I, I know i said early on we're going to talk about the songwriting process how much time have you got are you in a rush where no, have you got I'm, not, I'm not in a rush i i, I, I reckon another half an hour I, I? mate okay this is yeah, fantastic I'm, yeah I'm loving as long as long as i can have a um a vape <laughs> a vape, yeah, away. But don't, but vape away but don't 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 show this bit <laughs> Okay, Jack's on the cameraman. He's keeping the camera on me at the moment. We see a cloud of smoke. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, by, by the way, very un rock and roll of you to ask permission to have a vape. Oh yeah, I, I appreciate your time. I'm loving loving picking your brains. He's such a fascinating guy. Oh, cool man. Um, I'm, I'm liking the conversation. Yeah, do you, um, yeah. So one, one thing you talk about in the documentary is your marriage to um, Renice. Yeah, yeah. So so you, you were together like 20 years. Or, you've you've yes. been lucky in love, eh? I think. Yeah. So no, we were we were together from when I was. Uh, I think we met when I was 18 or mm. 19, very young. And she had um, a six-month-old daughter um, and uh, and it just all sort of fell into place. And um, and it was it didn't take long for me to love her daughter just as much as I loved her and uh, she became my daughter, you know. And, I, you know, she's still my daughter, you know. Mm. Like she's my stepdaughter, but she's my daughter, you know, and I love her. And... Um, yeah, the, yeah, the the the, the stepdaughter stepson thing. I I hate that. Like if you're if you're if you're a, if you're a dad, if you're yeah. present and you're there, you're, yeah. you're the fucking dad. But but in saying that, I I was I present. I was present when I was there, but I was away a lot of yeah. the time. That was Shihad was number one priority, and I think I was too young to be a dad, maybe or to be a, a dad that she deserved. I think personally, because I I loved her unconditionally, but. I was away for six to seven months mm. out of the year, living my dream. You yeah, know? and that was, I think, when you're a parent, you need to be prepared to part those dreams a little bit, not fully, mm. but just they're a priority, you know, mm. at that point. And um, I think I was a little bit young, mm. um, and but you know we've got a great relationship now, and that's that's cool. But um, yeah, has it evolved into a good friendship, a really good friendship. Yeah. You know, she's you know she's. Um, I think almost 30 now but she's she's a mm. amazing she's lived in london and yeah she had a great life and yeah. she's 
yeah she's really and she's so into music and i love that you know mm. and she still sends me new new artists and is, you should definitely check that out mm. definitely check this out yeah re- relationships are hard eh? like um yeah i was married to uh, jj who yeah. w- was my co-host and um I was probably similar to you in a way in that uh, I just wanted to be the I wanted to be a fucking savage on the radio. Yeah, totally. I just wanted to be like like a, a boss, and I had my yeah. fucking goals. So even though we weren't separated by distance, as in you being in Melbourne and your wife being in Wellington, we were we were working together. But I was just the relationship was sort of like a supplementary thing. Yeah. It was like I was so yeah. career focused and driven. And as you get older, you realise like it's it's like a plant. <laughs> like it you is. need to water a relationship, Absolutely, don't you? You do. And yeah. even and you know and and there was uh, there was a lot of things I learned. I, I you know, um, uh, Renice had had a pretty tough upbringing with um, with the with her parents, and there was she was very suspicious and very cautious of the world. Yeah, a very survivalist um, mentality. Uh, you know, young solo mum, she she took what she could get and held on tightly. You know, and I was definitely more sort of. I, I, I liked meeting new people and bouncing around the world and but I she was very suspicious of any new people that I brought into my life and and kept them at arm's distance and and I realized as I got older that this was actually really not where I wanted to be mm. um it was an unhealthy relationship I think Anaya had to see us fighting way more times than she should have yeah. and um and finally when Anaya turned 18 I got the courage up to go okay, I'm getting out. And it doesn't mean I don't love you. It's just that I need to get out for my sanity. And, mm. and, it, and, and it was the best move I ever made, you know. And um, because I, even though I was Johnny Rock and Roll Star, when I was at home, I was a fucking mouse. She knew how to keep me down, you know. And that was basically by destroying my ego, making me feel like if I left her, I would be a bum down the street in Courtney Place and I'd never be able to amount to anything. She knew how to play me, and she met me when I was really young. So I was sort of kept in that little mm. bubble and very strictly controlled. Mm. And uh, yeah, so I literally left thinking that I would literally be a bum down the street. But I was so unhappy that I was—I'd prefer that. I quickly learned that I could do internet banking, and I was a fucking. <laughs> <laughs> I can do it. <laughs> it's funny little things. Like that. How scary if you've never done them before. I, well, I mean, and, and you know, and that's why I never ever blame her for anything because I was totally complicit in that. Mm. I handed her the reins because it suited me. Mm. You know, I it suited me. So you can so, focus on the rock. So and roll I could just be. I home. could just be. You know, la la la. I didn't even know what I was fucking earning. Yeah. You know, and I needed to grow up. And I did, and I did uh, grow up quick. And then for two years, I, I fucking partied my ass off, and I had a great time doing it. Wrote the first adults record, met all these great musicians. I loved it. And then just as I was getting bored of staying mm. awake for three days and partying with <laughs> inappropriately aged people, I went. Uh, uh, I did a talk with Nick Dwyer. You remember Nick Nick D? Yeah, Nick D. Yeah, great, great human being oh uh, George FM guy George FM yeah and fantastic uh, n- really knowledgeable about music he did a Q&A with me at the Auckland Museum about song composition I remember I was hung over as fuck uh, when I arrived but it ended up being a great conversation the party afterwards down was down at a club in Britain I can't remember but Dana my now wife crashed the party with her friend and just came up to me and went you look interesting she didn't know who I was and I went you're the most beautiful human being I've ever seen in my life. And we just talked, we just got on like a house on fire straight away. I thought she was American because she had an American accent. But then I went, no, that's not quite right. But it turns out she was a daughter of a UN diplomat who was Sudanese. She was um, basically schooled in American schooling systems in the diplomat sort of circles. That you know, She'd done her primary school in Finland, went to Ethiopia, then Virginia in America, then Saudi Arabia, and then ended up in AUT in Auckland. Yes, yeah, starting to be a chiropractor. Chiropractor, that's true right. citizen of the world. Yeah, totally, totally. And um, and we just got on like a house on fire. And it was it, it was exciting, but at the same time, it was more like I could just breathe out. It was like a feeling of oh, there you are, mm. you know. And I just knew straight away. Yeah, and I suppose the timing was right. Like you had um, evolved and grown into the the person that was worthy of being with her. Yeah, yeah. And I also knew what I didn't want. 
mm. and that's just as important yeah as as knowing what you want you mm. know i mean i was not i mean the irony of mar marrying a sudanese muslim woman and then converting to islam while being johnny too good from shihad the rock band is ridiculous i would never have written that <laughs> but that's just what happened yeah she was my best mate it took us two years of like like these huge philosophical conversations where i was like in fact i think even on the second date we had i was like are you saying to me that the only way i can marry you is if i convert to islam and she was like well i don't know why you're talking about marriage we only this is only our second th and it's like yeah but i really like you and i'm just finding out and she was like well yeah that's how it's done i was like well why don't you convert to atheism you know <laughs> la, 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 la. and it was like yeah, why do i have to do and it was like so we did but we knew we loved each other and we were and we just laugh at the same shit but only difference was she prayed five times a day and would give her last ten dollars to the person who needed it on the street without even batting an eyelid because she believed that all money was not hers anyway. It was came from a lot. It was a gift from a lot. So you give it on. You know, you're just, you know, you've got that's a stream of energy, and you got to keep it moving. Mm. And that was just the way she was brought up. And I'd be like struggling artist going, fuck, I don't even know if I'm going to earn fifteen grand this year. <laughs> so if any money I get, I'm going to hold on tightly to it. You know, like yeah. so. Me and my you know humanist atheist buddies would be talking the good game. It's like, well, we don't need God. To, to know that we would treat people how we would want to be treated ourselves, which is totally the mm. right thing. I totally agree with that. But we we're still struggling artists, so we wouldn't give our last $5 because we didn't know the next time we are getting, getting fucking paid mm. and we didn't have any faith that we would get paid. She believed absolutely that it would come in another form. And without a doubt, following around like a little puppy, she'd give her last $10 away and then she'd be comped fucking dinner at some place randomly. And I'd be going, how the fuck does that work? That's what made me want to look mm. into it, you know. Yeah, but what, what, has that, what does it mean to you? What's, what's being a Muslim brought to your life? I think, uh, uh, I think most importantly, it's made me realise it's not about me and it's also not about the material things in this life that we accumulate that we all have to give away when we end up dying. Mm. It's like, it's actually... Also, it's taught me that, you know, because she would drag me to, you know, like down to you know flinders street station in melbourne to feed homeless people i'd never done that before i was scared mm. and then i did it and went and after we did it i went home and i had the best sleep i'd had in probably 20 years because i and i woke up and i went why is that oh it's because by helping other people you're literally helping yourself mm. because they're all just manifestations of the same fucking thing anyway mm. You know, it's like that, that, you know, that modern, you know, that Western capitalist idea of this is mine, that's yours, fuck off. It's like, that's not how it is. That's just, just a fucking illusion. We're all, you know, physical, you know, versions of a spiritual sort of existence, like literally fucking having this experience together. So we should literally be looking out for each other because what happens to you does come back on him. Mm -hmm. On, on how I'm feeling as well, you know, like, so yeah, so I don't know, it just vibed with me. And I also like the idea of zakat, you know, giving zakat at the end of uh, Ramadan, which is basically 2.5% of all the stuff you've earned of the year, you give it to the people in your community that need it, that have less than you. It focuses your mind, unlike capitalism, which focuses your mind on what you don't have, oh, my car's good, but it's not as good as the mm. neighbors. It focuses your mind on people who've got less than you, mm. Therefore, you have more peace in your heart, you sleep better. And it's better for everybody because you're helping people out while you're doing that. Mm. You know, and it's like, it's really interesting. I, I just think it's, um, it's almost like the antithesis to the modern capitalist sort of way of thinking, mm. you know? Yeah. It just feels like a hard, hard religion to get into, like with uh, the, sure. the Ramadan and the fasting and yep. five times Which a starts, day. Which starts for me tomorrow. Yeah, what does that um, mean? Because that means basically I get up. Um, probably about four, 45 minutes before um, uh, morning prayer and uh, have some food, usually it's something like porridge, and drink a lot of water because you're not allowed to drink water during the day either. Um, and then I, I fast for that the, until the sun goes down. Um, and the idea is to remind yourself it's not about this world, it's about the next world. And it's also, it's not about the things you have and it's also 
there are people doing it hard like this every day Mm -hmm. and this is what it feels like to struggle and it just i don't know there's something quite it's hard don't get me wrong like there's days where i'm just like fuck this (laughs) you know it's so hard and then but then it's like any process the the it's like you know working on your physique or anything you burst through that hard bit and all of a sudden there's this moment of serenity of three days Mm. and then it will get hard again and then you you, you know and then you find that peace and then it's like it's really it's a real mental and physical challenge and i think it's it's really good for you you know it's good Mm. for you to remind yourself that not everyone gets to fucking go to the fridge and just go i'll have that oh i don't even know what to choose i've got so much to choose from you know, it's just mm. a really good reminder of that shit. Yeah. And are the kids, are the kids Muslim? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. They're brought up Muslim. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think I'm a convert, so I'll see things differently than someone who's brought up inside the religion. You know, like um, I still struggle with, you know, even things like angels or stuff like that because I find that too specific, you know. But I do, what I don't struggle with is we're all connected we're all going to die. We're all going to go back to where we came from, mm. where, wherever that is, you know. And we live in the West where it's like, life, 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 life. Someone dies. What the fuck? Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. as if that wasn't coming for them. You know, Spoiler alert. it's like it, that's just that's. Yeah. So I think with Islam, it, it's like it's not morbid. It's just reminding you that this is just a this is just one phase, mm. you know, like and what you do with it, it's, it's important. But it's um, it's and in fact uh, it's it's important in a test for like what did I give you while you were in this little this little du- what they call it dunya the dunya which is the the physical world, uh, what did you do that that question is going to be asked what did you do with the stuff I gave you, did you pass it on, or did you hoard it like mm. a fucking dragon mm. like Elon Musk, you know <laughs> Elon Musk is <laughs> fucking sitting on his big pile of cash going ah. Oh. Yeah, there's a b- bunch of them, eh? Musk, Bezos, Zuckerberg. There, there's, I, I, I totally agree with that. There should be no reason in this world where there's so much poverty and so much, you know, pro- so many problems that people should be hoarding that much mm. wealth. Fuck that, you know. That is that's unjust, mm. and it's actually fucking the reason. The more they have, the less everybody else has, because there's only a certain amount to go around, mm. you know. It's I feel like this has always been. This, this isn't a Muslim thing. This has always been. No, nah, it's, always, right? been, it's yeah. always been my jam. Yeah. yeah, it's always been my jam. And, and and how's it been being um, becoming a dad? Like in your in your mid forties, I, I I feel like you're probably in a better a better place, like emotionally, mentally, yeah. everything, yeah, uh, spiritually to 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 deal with them. And I think being older dads is, is it's definitely more of a accepted sort of. It's quite a normal thing now. Um, uh, there's a lot. I, I know a lot of dads my age who had children around 38 40 blah blah mm. blah i think mentally it's way good like because it's like i wanted to have these children so it wasn't like oh this will be cool uh, it was well, like yeah. i want these children well, so you've you know? done you've done yourself a shit that's right and i'm never i'm never looking at them going oh, i sort of i love you but i resent you because i can't go out and do this because i've already fucking done it mm. you know so that's great where it's hard is i think physically it's harder compared to if you're a 26 year old dad you know like i'll be holding my daughter go to go to fucking you know empty a dishwashing machine ah, <laughs> what the, the fuck my back's gone end up on my ass for a week you know and that's where it's harder you know like i think physically it's harder but i think mentally it's better yeah yeah, yeah. so your, your stage diving days are behind you oh i staged i i, I crowd surfed at meat stock the other day <laughs> crowd surfed to the sound sound desk and back fuck man i i went and saw bruce springsteen when he played in melbourne he crowd surfed the length of the rod labor arena mm. three times he's incredible he he's 60, old he's 69 yeah. or something and i was like if he can do it i can fucking do he's it. in great shape he's in great shape. Do, you, do you still take your top off on stage or no no fuck that I, mean, <laughs> I, got, I got old man titties now it's gross <laughs> oh, man, titties. it's so ugly nah i try i try I, I look after myself but i I, nah, those days are good. Save, save that for Iggy Pop and Anthony Kiedis. Yeah. yeah oh, good on you. And what, what are your kids into? How did, how, were the, I feel like all kids are into, go through like a Wiggles phase or a... No, they didn't really do the Wiggles. I mean, I tried to, No, actually, she did. She was into Emma. Like, she thought she, Emma was the bee's knees, and she was. She was great. Um, uh, but he... I mean, they, he, they were into Pokemon um, big time. 
uh, he's really into comics. Like he loves Guardians of the Galaxy comics and, um, you know, uh, Marvel comics. So he loves that. I was like that too, which is why I loved Kiss when I was a kid because they were like a mix between music and comics, you know, like, uh, but he's, yeah, he's, and he's really into uh, visual art. So he loves drawing. I've tried to, he, 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 he wanted to, me to t teach him how to get, play the guitar. But when I showed him a few chords, he was like, ow, that hurts my fingers. <laughs> Fuck that. So he's like, he's not doing that. So if he comes, I'm, I'm always here if he wants to come back to it. Just but, not pushing them into anything. No, no. It's what, whatever they're passionate about, you know, like, if he wants to be a, the best accountant in the world, I'm down with it. Like if that's what it, if that's what he wants to wake up and do with his life, mm. I we are not pushing them to be anything that we want them to be. Uh, all we want them to be is to be generous, good human beings that uh, understand when to help out when mm. they see people who need help. You know, and that's yeah. literally that's that's the baseline. You know? oh, I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, if your kids can be. I mean, it's impossible to be happy all the time, but if they could be happy most of the time yeah. and well adjusted, I think yeah, that's man. really cool. Yeah. Um, shit, we've covered a lot of ground. I'm we'll all just, good too. Okay, right. we'll, we'll go back for a couple of. Do you need another puff? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you vape out. Yeah, help yourself. Um, yeah, I wanted to pick your brains about your, your songwriting process. So I'm, cool. I mentioned Pacifier. I, I love that song so much. And when I feel like over the years, you've done a few interviews and you've talked about how it's um, about Aaron from Weta, who yeah. uh, tragically passed away with a yeah, heart attack a few years ago. So sad. So um, it's just a beautiful song. So he was bipolar? Yeah, he had, he had bipolar um, uh, yeah, disorder. And yeah. uh, that would mean that he would... And, and manic manic episodes. So, yeah. Just he, the extremities of bipolar yeah, yeah, highs and lows. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so, so you, you write the song. Do you, do, like, do, do you play it to him? Do you, you, do you give him no, a... No, not at all. No, not at all. Did, In fact, he knew it was about him, though. Well, I... I did I know? Did he, yeah, I suppose he did. Yeah, I mean, he would have heard me saying that. I mean, I didn't. No, I didn't go out of my way to tell him about it. I just, I mean, he was a mate, you know. But so I, cause I, I was, um, you yeah, listening to it with it through a different lens the other day, knowing you were coming in, and I was thinking if, um, if I had a friend that was in a band and he wrote a song like that about me, mm. I, I, I don't know. I, I think I'd maybe I'd feel a bit def defensive, or <laughs> may, maybe I'd just burst into tears. It's a beautiful song. Well, it's a, like a, it's like a. Like a love song to a mate. Yeah, it is in a way. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I, I, I Recently, I've written a song called Last of the Lonely Gods, which is about my friend, Marty, who's a great chef, who ended up cooking on a luxury yacht in the south of France that... Who and it was owned. It was owned by that Thai billionaire who used to own the Leicester City team that died in the helicopter accident. Wow. So he, he, and he was in a relationship for 10 years with this younger woman in the south of France and she wanted to have kids and he couldn't bring himself to say I'm ready and then he came back to um, um, Aotearoa and we, we hooked up and he was like going what am I going to do I'm going to have to start again I'm 50 years old what the fuck man and and I, it was just a little a song for him just saying you know, every day is a fucking opportunity to mm. start again, mm. you know? Yeah. You know, and that's I how I that. look at life, you know? It's like, it's like, even, I, I even look nowadays at, at when I fuck up something on stage, the next verse is a chance to redeem myself if I if I sung that mm. note wrong, you know? I don't let it freak me out. I just go, I just go, cool, fuck that up. I'm not going to fuck up next time, you know? Like, and that's how I look at life as well. And and I wrote the song from, and, and when I went to play it to him, I, I just realised that the first verse is, um, your dreams, they lie in smoking ruins, thought that you understood. You use up all your um, secret weapons. They don't work as they should. Now, everywhere there's people doing things you thought you would, and all your roads have led to nothing. Well, nothing any good. <laughs> mm. and, and I thought, he's... Oh, shit. <laughs> I forgot about that first verse because it then goes into don't let it bring you down. You were brave enough to make it out. You're the last of the lonely gods. One by one, you will defeat him one by one. Right? So it's like... You don't want to lose him with the first yeah, verse. Yeah, yeah. But, but I thought... And then he just... He was just fucking getting into it and he went, I fucking love this song. Mm. And so even though it did sort of start with him, what I, what I heard him saying to me... It's a, it's a positive message afterwards. So, but it, it, I did get the sweats on when I was, when I remembered that that's what the first verse was. But he fucking loved it, you know. Like he didn't take offence to it at all, you know. Yeah. So so when you when you write these songs, is, uh, 
Do you have like a melody in mind or are you just writing notes on your phone or you're humming into a phone? What, what's the yeah, process? Yeah, so I, I always start with music because music always tells me where the, where the words are going to go because music can be bittersweet, it can be totally sad, it can be happy, it can be joyous, it can be ambiguous, it can be angry and that dictates where the words are going to go, you know, and and that makes it sound easy but it's not easy so I still every time I go to write a song it's like the first time I've written a song because it's fucking hard work because you've you've got it not only got to come up with a melody line that sticks in your head because that's what I do for, that's my second stage it's like music melody line words and that's how I do it so melody line's got to be something that I will remember mm. and then words come after that what am I thinking about so and so uh, you don't want any lines that you're going. Uh, oh, that well, that's not even part of that fucking story, which I used to do when I was younger, because I just I wasn't realizing what the actual art form mm. was. I was just like I was painting, 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 and sometimes I get lucky, like with pacifier or, or I had something in my mind straight away. I knew or mm. home again, you know, like I I knew exactly what that was about. It was about that feeling of being in a fucking hotel in L.A. Going, I just want to be it. I just want to be home in Aotearoa, you know. Like, mm. um, yeah. By the way, that's a great. Put put your clocks back for the winter. That's a yeah. Great which is that because I because I was spending most of my time in my relationship on the fucking phone, right? With someone who was on the other side of the planet doing something opposite to me, mm. you know. So um, that was just an image that came, you know. So, but it it's a, it's something you have to work at, man, and work at and work at. And sometimes songs just go boom, and sometimes songs you know there's something in there. You have to mine for it, mm. and it takes sometimes. It takes a year, you know, and then you finally get it. Do you have like a moleskin notebook, or do you write notes in your phone? I, you I usually like, write on my phone, yeah. but but no, if I'm out. But when I'm at home, always pen paper. So I just have a stack of fucking A4 unfinished songs, A4 everywhere. white shit with just like, and and I think the act of physically writing mm. makes it. It, it makes it more real, you mm. know, and it also makes it more memorable. When you're writing on a typewriter <laughs> or, or, or on your phone, it's like it doesn't quite get into your brain the same, you yeah. know. Like, yeah, so I find the physical act of, of handwriting mm. really, really good for writing music. E any real quick ones? Uh, yeah, so recently um, a song called um, Love Is Forever, that came very quickly and that was about m my mum hanging on for a person that, you know, that never made it. So, you know, you were there, now you're gone. Just a picture on our wall. Um, I, I changed it to three days hanging on because it, I thought 13 days is just too long. I said, yeah, three days hanging on, waiting for someone who'd never come. But you're alive when I see my little girl in her eyes, the stillness of the world. Um, in your time, you knew that you were loved and love is forever. You know, and that's and that's... And that just came really quickly because I knew exactly what I needed to write about, you know, like it was just there, mm. you know. Is it a sad song or a happy song? I think it's bittersweet. I think it's it's sad because I've lost my mum, but I'm looking at my daughter mm. and she goes, and, and, and she's got the same legs as mum and the same eyes as mum. And it's like, you're still there, but just in a different mm. form, you know, like, and that, that's that, you know, cycle, cyclic, the cycle of life, you know, like, and it's just, um, yeah, and I, that's my comfort is seeing her, you know, and, and my daughter. Yeah. And how long, it, how long does it take before you can perform these songs and disassociate them from the person they're about? Do you know you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm already playing these songs mm. at my solo shows. So I, I'm actually, it's interesting because there's a different skill live because live is, am I putting my the guitar in the right place? Am I strumming right? Is my guitar in tune? Am I hitting the right note? Am I okay? There's the story. Okay, cool. Am I telling the story? So it's like there's lots going on, and and again, mindfulness, which is again mm. why we're so you know sensitive beings attracted to this art form, because you literally can't be anywhere else. You have to be right there, and it's um, it's just it's enforced mindfulness, and it's such a good feeling. And I'm and and we talked about it earlier. I didn't really consider myself a singer until maybe ten years ago, and now it's like. When you when you're literally breathing and then hitting that note and saying that that story, 
fuck man there's nothing that feels that good you know really feels great you know it's like it's the breath and it's also the the story you know and those notes you know it's a really amazing feeling yeah fuck i love that yeah it's cool my god um what's the future going to bring for john too good well so solo record without a doubt and i think before the solo record comes out or maybe in amongst that i think she had want to do because we're going to have to have a little bit of a break so i can do this um is so everyone in the band okay with that they are and they because they, they know that i'm i mean they, they were okay with the adults too mm. you know like because the thing is it's it, it doesn't take away from the band. It means that I learn more words to use when I come back to the band, mm. you know, more more tricks to use, you know, like, you know, it's like... Yeah, it's just sharpening that knife, isn't absolutely. it? Absolutely, yeah. it informs it, you know, so they're cool with it, mm. yeah. It's, it's um, you, got, you must be proud of that relationship, like the, the band, yeah. de- dealing with the band dynamic. I mean, you, yeah, you've, you've toured with um, Metallica. Have you seen some kind of monster? Yeah, in absolutely. Your documentary? Yeah. Like, we yeah. went and saw that at the Melbourne um, Film Festival, and we were in, in the light because we we were massive Metallica mm. fans, but by the time that came out, not so much. We were more into I don't know alternative and mm. Indian dance and blah 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 blah. But we're still still it's still Metallica, you know. So we we're in this queue with like all these serious Metallica fans, and we get in there, and everyone's going Metallica, Metallica. And I was like, wow, and it's gonna be cool. And then it just like by the time it's hitting, you know, the the therapist writing <laughs> suggesting lines for their songs all these hardcore Metallica fans are just going, looking at each other going, what the fuck is this? Yeah. But I thought it was so brave to do that. It was courageous. It but, was incredible. So so much vulnerability. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, just goes to show, like I suppose, the dynamics and the complexities of, of being in a band. And oh, you, you guys have navigated that, and you must be so proud of that. We, uh, but, but that's we've had group therapy as well. Oh, have you? Yeah, absolutely. And, it, and it's... And it's not. I'm not ashamed of that at all because it's a fucking. It's nothing. Absolutely, it's nothing a long-term of. relationship, yeah. and there are things that have been left unsaid that are festering away. That like that time you fucking, bow, you know, you fucking insulted me in front of that person. I've never said anything about, it, but I've held on to it, and and you know like and so and, and that person may not have even fucking realised, yeah. you know. But but having a forum for where everyone gets to shut up while that person says, man. I still fucking hate the fact that you did that to me and that really hurts me Mm. because it makes me really guarded around you or blah, 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 blah. That shit's really important to get out out in the open. So it just, we've, after we did that, we've, we're so, we we love each other so much more, so much more forgiving of each other. And I think that comes with age as well. Mm. You know, when you're young, you're egotistical and it's like, you're going, well, you fucked up here and you fucked up here and you said that and that's dumb thinking and I don't agree with that. But Nat, when you're older, you go, fuck, I'm full of all those dumb contradictions myself. <laughs> so therefore, once you become a bit more self depreciate on yourself, you, you're far more forgiving of other people's mm. fucking faults because we've all got them, you know? I think that comes with age as well, mm. you know? Abs- it's a trade-off, eh? Like you talked before about emptying the dishwasher and putting you back out. So <laughs> there's the uh, the physical impediments that come with age, but it's uh, the, the the mind stuff you get. Oh, totally, And the, the, yeah, the awareness. I, I, like I think everyone in their 20s, you just, you want to, you want world domination. Absolutely. And then when you when you get to your 40s or 50s, you realise, actually, if I can just make sure my household or my street or my community is good, community. I'm yeah. succeeding. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, that's cool. Um, and I- any stories about um, Metallica, Guns N' Roses, Black um, Sabbath? Did you do Lines of Ants with Ozzy Osbourne? Oh, uh, no, no, no. Oh, oh, so Black Sabbath was, was, I found that really inspiring because, like I was saying earlier, it was like great to see Tony Iommi, you know, the guitarist that wrote all those fucking riffs that were a huge part of my childhood and my and many mm. people around the world just come in and be like a workman about mm. it and they had a and they had the same crew they'd had for years and everybody knew each other it was no rock star bullshit it was about the job that they were doing same acdc was exactly the same mm. real workman like um approach to it which being brought up in a household with a carpenter and blah blah it really vibed with me it was like it made me go right you can create something big and wonderful and not lose yourself to all the trappings of fame mm-hmm. because you surround yourself with family and you do your job mm-hmm. you know you're there to do a job and and for me watching him and Giza Butler the bass player watch our band pretty much every night they watched our band and then finally Giza came up to me and went um 
it's so fucking refreshing to have a band that we actually like fucking supporting us. And can you sign these CDs for my son in Nottingham, who's a massive She Had fan? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> And wow. then talk, talking about his love of West Ham United and stuff like that. And, mm. and uh, it was just, they were so familiar to me because of all the expats that I grew up with as well. Mm. They were like my uncles. They reminded me of that sort of vibe, you know? Yeah. And they fucking put on a mean show and they were older guys, you mm. know? So that was cool. Um, and Guns N' Roses was interesting. Guns N' Roses we toured with when it was only Axel really and a whole bunch of ringins. Oh yeah. So I mean it was massive and it was us then Corn then Guns N' Roses so big arenas all around wow. Australia it was fantastic. I think my funniest story about that is one day I was uh, backstage in the catering tent waiting to get my food order when a helicopter landed right by the catering tent and out pops Axel Rose with this gorgeous looking young woman and walks straight up to me and goes, is that fish or chicken? <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, I think it's chicken. And that was just, it was just such a surreal situation. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a helicopter lands, big rock star comes out, <laughs> asks me if it's fish or chicken. And it was so normal, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, what a yarn. Shit, yeah. what a life. What a career. Yeah, it's cool. Um, and yeah, I, I feel like with your growth mindset, it's like you're just in the second half. Totally, totally man. Yeah. Totally. I've just got to stick around and not die. You know, and just got oh, to I don't think you're myself. going anywhere. You, you feel, yeah, yeah. you got longevity in your family? Uh, yeah, no, not really. Well, mum was 84 when she passed. Dad was younger. He was 76, I think. Um, and his family, all, all, apart from his, his sister Rita, who's still around, she must be hitting 90 now so yeah i mean it's possible but yeah a lot of his brothers died young but they were all fucking heavy smokers yeah man. you know and i i you know well you'll be right what are, what are you what are your vices or bad habits now just the vape vape uh yeah vape and ca caffeine i think i yeah. mean caffeine i yeah i just limit it to one once a day i'm really caffeine sensitive and it makes me quite hyperactive you know but you I, don't need it. But I just, I just do long walks, man. Because mm. I, I, running was never my thing. I just, I, my shins and ankles are just hurt too much. But walking's good, you know. And I just go on long walks and make sure there's lots of hills in there, you know. Mm. Uh, and that, that seems to be okay. I'll do the occasional high, high, high intensity. But I've got high blood pressure as well. So mm. I've got to watch um, a caffeine like right. this, but also doing too much high intensity mm. as well. What are you, what are you walking? Do you walk in shorts? Yeah, yeah. I can't, I just, I can't imagine yeah, you in shorts. Yeah, I think shorts, I'm all like a fucking like uh, workout top. <laughs> just got my got my AirPods on, listening to, you know, maybe Pod some talk about how Carthage fall, fell to Rome and 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 you know, just I just want to know about the world. Yeah, I, I love history. I always liked history, but I love history more as an older guy because mm. it just explains where we are so much better than almost looking at what's yeah. happening right now. You know, like. It just means you've got a better understanding of why we're why we're experiencing what we're experiencing mm. now, you know. So I love history. Yeah, that's my jam and politics. I'm a politics junkie. Yeah, I, like American politics or so any politics, all. So mm. British, um, because of that's where my parents' heritage was, and uh, also American because that has a role on effect to everybody. Mm. Um, so it's very important what happens there. It's a clusterfuck. Over it is there, a clusterfuck. <laughs> but I got to say, yeah, the, the the new government over here are doing a pretty good job of fucking clusterfuck, mate. They're not. They're not. A, it's been. It's been a pretty much a fucking clown show. Yeah. Uh, and I'm. I'm not. You know. I, I thought it was going to be bad, but I. I'm every day. I'm going. What you're going to do? What now? It's like, yeah, it's a great idea taking you know, food off off underprivileged kids. It's, and then giving it to landlords, great idea. Fuck yeah, mate, great mm. idea. You know, oh, let's get rid of the Murray Health uh, uh, Authority. Yeah, it's oh, it's a great idea. Mm. Yeah, let's fucking get rid of smoke free. Yeah, oh, that's a really good idea. <laughs> great idea. Great idea. I wonder where these ideas are coming from. Ah, oh, the people that paid for you to get into fucking power. I mean, it's so brazen. I mean, it's mm. unbelievable. Would, and, would you, you would know, you ever want to get into politics? Hell no, because I'm far too passionate, and yeah. I would offend too many people. And I would say something that would quickly be used as a soundbite and that would be my career over. Mm. I think I can help better as an artist. Mm. And art, artists have this 
beautiful little pocket where we can actually say what we fucking want because it's art, you know? Mm. And we, we're not being paid by the taxpayer. Yes, I've had, you know, New Zealand on air funding without doubt, and I'm very thankful for it. Um, uh, but we get to comment, you know, and it's like uh, there's, there's something, there's a freedom afforded us that I don't think is afforded to politicians, uh, especially in the structures that we've set up. I, I, I love Chloe. I think she, she speaks pretty, pretty good truth, mm. and I think she's leader material. I've voted Labour my whole life, but I think she's the most inspiring politician I've seen recently in this country. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to get on her on the podcast. Oh, I, shit, I think she, she's fascinating. She fascinating. and she she believes, you know, mm-hmm. she's a believer, and you can tell the way she talks that she thinks humans are awesome, mm. and that's why she gets angry, mm. like I get angry, because <laughs> we believe when humans do good things. I mean, they are capable of some beautiful things, mm. and that's why we get angry when we see people being greedy or selfish or it's just the antithesis of what mm. the opportunity we have on this planet to do such great things yeah. and it's like I hate watching it squandered mm. I hate watching it squandered it really fucks me off yeah shit your mum and dad would be so proud of the, <laughs> the man you've become right oh I don't know oh, dad, me and dad had nothing left unsaid which was beautiful yeah I, you know I got to nurse him and help mum out when he was really ill and um, there was nothing left unsaid between me and him, so I'm mm. very grateful for that. And um, but and and I know Mum was proud of me, so that's cool. Yeah, you know? yeah. Hey, thank you so much for your time. Pleasure, today. man. My God, it's been almost two hours. Yeah, um, totally. Yeah, Fuck, that's seriously long form, bro. Yeah, yeah. I, I um yeah. Hope your car hasn't been towed from New World. <laughs> oh shit! Yeah, let's get out of here, man. <laughs> Fuck. All right, hey mate, mate, love your work, and I look forward to seeing what you do next. Because awesome. whatever, whatever you do, it's going to be exceptional. Uh, thanks, Dom. Yeah, thanks for having me, mate. It was been great. Good conversation. Loved it. <laughs>